starting the recording and letting I can know we can begin the broadcast. Oh yay, oh yay, oh yay. All persons having business before the Honorable, the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit are admonished to draw near and give their attention for the court is now sitting. God save the United States and this honorable court. Case number 18-1209 et al. North Star Wireless LLC and SNR Wireless License Co. LLC at balance versus Federal Communications Commission. Ms. Stetson for the petitioner North Star Wireless LLC. Ms. Flood for the respondent. Morning. Good morning, your honors. Morning. And may it please the court, good morning. Uh, my name is Kate Stetson. I'm arguing for North Star and SNR this morning. This case is here after a remand to the FCC. And when it was last here in 2017, this court held two things. First, the court upheld the commission's determination that SNR and North Star's agreements with their investor DISH gave DISH too much control over those small businesses for them to qualify as designated entities suitable for bidding credits under an auction. Second though, this court also held that the commission had failed to give SNR and North Star sufficient notice that if a control finding was lodged after the auction, of course, that they would not be permitted to cure that control finding as other applicants had. So this court remanded to, and I'll quote here, give petitioners an opportunity to seek to negotiate a cure for the de facto control the FCC found the DISH exercises over them. That's pin site 1025 of the prior opinion. The FCC did not give petitioners that opportunity. Instead, taking one sentence of this court's opinion out of context, the commission simply directed SNR and North Star to renegotiate their agreements with DISH and to submit those amendments to the commission for further comment and review. There was no discussions with commission staff, there was no guidance, uh, and there was no negotiation of a cure. The petitioners did what they could without staff input uh, and submitted amendments addressing you did, the you did meet with a couple of the commissioners and maybe even three of them and and one other commissioner's staff before the decision issued is that correct we did judge millet um less than a day before the decision well, issued. one of them was more than one, one meeting was more than that if you're discussing if you're talking about the may 2018 meeting with uh, Commissioner Clyburn, that ha actually had to do with the draft opinion from the commission mm -hmm. uh, denying the petition for review of the remand order itself. So that, that did not pertain to the submitted um, amendments, which hadn't been submitted at that point. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about the November 2020 meetings, those of course came almost two and a half years after the, or well, you, met with, you just said the day before, but I think you met with, uh, three of the commissioners on November 2nd. Is that we met wrong? with one commissioner, Commissioner Carr, on November 2nd, and three of them on November 16th at 1130, 1 and 4, I believe. The opinion that we're talking about now issued on, uh, was, was adopted on November 17th mm -hmm. and made public on the 23rd. But more to the point, Judge Millett, the window closed for amendments in June of 2018. So the fact that we were permitted an opportunity to talk to the commissioners, not with, and certainly not to receive guidance from them, one day before this 90 some odd page opinion issued is cold comfort. The fact is that was not the process that this court ordered. It was not the process that ClearCom followed. Can I ask and you another question? Oh. Um, it seems as though SNR did exercise its put and is now wholly owned by DISH. Does that move their petition? It, it doesn't. And let me make one correction. SNR has notified DISH that it intends to exercise its put, mm -hmm. uh, but that is subject to the FCC granting an application for a transfer of control. That application hasn't even been filed yet, likely will be filed later this spring. So as things stand now, there is no, it's status quo. There is no transfer of control whatsoever. Well, of course, update the court, you know, if, if or when that occurs, depending SNR on- SNR has said it, it does wish to issue its put. If the yeah, it, it, it does indeed. SNR, not North Star, but SNR. Yes. But, but none of that, of course, had trans, has transpired yet. Ms. Stetson, can we go back to whether or not um, some sort of a 
inter iterative process was actually ordered by the court. Sure. Um, you accuse uh, opposing counsel of focusing on you know, one sentence in the opinion and using that to evade the responsibility, but I don't see in the opinion where this court uh, actually required the kind of iterative process that you say is now um, it was mandated. So can you help me to understand where you come from, where are you getting uh, the, the argument that you needed to actually uh, have the opportunity to engage in the type of process that ClearCom uh, uh, indicated? Certainly, Judge Jackson. And I think it's in the prior panel's discussion of ClearCom itself and in its pin sites to ClearCom. If you look at ClearCom, and I would direct you in, in particular to two paragraphs, paragraph seven and paragraph 24. You'll see in paragraph seven, among other things, that ClearCom talks about the meetings and conference calls that were held with respect to the petition for reconsideration. And then even more important, paragraph 24, look at footnotes 99 and 100. Footnote 99 says, in the course of resolving this issue, it became clear that one of the parties was operating under a misconception and that was cleared up. Footnote 100, this issue arose during the course of meetings and was not substantively briefed, but the petition concluded, the commission concluded it could reach that uh, conclusion anyway. What, it, what, is your, what, it, what is your response? I, I understand yeah. what actually happened in ClearCom, but what, what is your response to the argument that the prior panel only cited ClearCom in support of its fair notice finding as a potential reason why your client might've been confused into thinking that um, that some cure opportunity was going to be provided, as opposed to uh, being cited for a duty to actually engage in that type of uh, negotiation. I don't see mm -hmm. that, and I worry that, that a holding to that extent actually is inconsistent with what I understood the prior panel to be saying about um, actually curing is not what they were ordering. Uh, that the FCC could, in fact, as long as it gave notice, um, not even give you an opportunity to cure as long as up front they said, uh, clearly, you get one shot at this. So if that's true, if the FCC did not have to actually give you an opportunity to cure, it's confusing to me um, that you're suggesting that the panel also held that any opportunity to cure had to have certain features. Judge Jackson, let me take that a, a couple bits at a time. The first is the quote that I read to you at the beginning of the argument, which is this court remanded to allow petitioners an opportunity to seek to negotiate a cure for the de facto control the FCC found. So we can we can slice the opinion as the as as the FCC does to say or to to suggest that well they never said here is the process to be followed, but of course they didn't need to. And that's the second thing that I would offer to this court. In 2006, in a final rule, a commission final rule, I might add, uh, this is a final rule that is cited by the prior opinion. Uh, at pin site 1046, the commission said this, and, and bear with me because it's a 20 second quote. In applying our controlling interest standard, commission staff has carefully reviewed agreements between applicants claiming designated entity status and other existing wireless carriers. In these cases, staff has usually undertaken discussions with such designated entity applicants in order to obtain revisions to agreements to ensure that entities with whom they've partnered are not an attributable controlling interest. So we don't need to go excavating through ClearCom and its footnotes to see exactly what the commission directed happened. That is from a 2006 final rule. We said usually. Go ahead, go ahead Judge Jackson. No, I was just gonna follow up by saying, so is it, is it your position then that what was necessary here for the FCC to avoid reversal was to give you some kind of an iterative process? And if so, how much of an iterative process? Enough that you would actually cure? Is that, are you saying we have to be able to solve all of the problems? Mm, no, we're not, Judge Jackson. And that was a point that the prior panel made as well. Nothing obligated the FCC to permit a cure. 
But what the FCC has done, and, and it's understandable because of course the FCC in these discussions, the reason it has these discussions is not only because of the timing problem we're talking about, uh, the fact that these examinations are made after the fact, after the auction and after money is committed and, bills, uh, and bids are upheld. It's that the FCC in these discussions actually is supposed to be a force for good helping the designated entities obtain some leverage against their investors. Uh, that's why the FCC participates in these discussions alongside the designated entities and their passive investors. So the fact that the FCC declined in this instance, unlike every other instance, to participate in these discussions actually- What more could it have said? I mean, in this case, you had a whole opinion by the FCC that had focused on the deficiencies. I'm not sure what more you hoped to glean from yeah. a back and forth with the actual commission staff? Two things. The first is in ClearCon, the parties had a whole letter identifying at least 30 questions that the FCC had about the transfer of control in that case. The second is, uh, as we point out in our brief, the fact that we had an opinion is cold comfort for two reasons. The first is, and the FCC emphasizes this over and over and over again. The totality of the circumstances analysis is the touchstone of the FCC's process. So the fact that the FCC in 2015 identified a number of deficiencies, which we cured, apparently was not enough because as you will have seen, the FCC in 2020 came back with a number of other concerns, including concerns that were present in the 2015 agreements. So not only was the 2015 order some kind of panacea, it just identified the problems that could combined lead to a control finding. And you'll notice if you've read the 2015 opinion, what the commission says over and over again is, this might not be a problem standing by itself, but in combination with these other problems, it's an issue. Um, in 2020, what the commission chose to do is to say, yes, yes, you cured the major things that we identified in 2015. You terminated the management services agreement, which permeated the 2015 opinion. You terminated the technology, you terminated the trademark agreement. You completely revised the investor protections in order to come within the six things prescribed by Baker Creek and the six things I would mention that the commission at footnote 232 of its 2015 order said are common passive investor protections. We did all of those things. And then the commission came back and said, ah, but you've got this common- You changed some other things too though. It's we not as not though all you did was eliminate things. You changed things as well. And so <clears throat> the commission says, um, and tell me why they're wrong, <coughs> that um, you created more new problems. Um, for example, on the investor protections and, the, and the, particularly the control over um, leasing decisions, eliminating the ordinary course of business, for example. Yeah. Um, and so there were a number of other, it, it wasn't as though you just erased the things they didn't like and everything else was status quo. What they point to is a lot of new things that came in and the continuing put obligation um, which was flagged in the fifth memorandum opinion and order, uh, was mentioned at oral argument as a real problem in this case. Um, and um, uh, in fact, you know, from the commission's view, and you can tell me how, why they're wrong, but from their view, you know, the pressure to exercise that put remained because of the, you know, ballooning um, equity uh, stock that was now going to go um, to DISH and the constraints, the very hard constraints on their ability to finance building a network, you know, building out and, 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 and doing anything to actually function successfully as a business. That's, that's my summary. They'll tell me if I got it wrong um, of, of the changes um, or the repackaging, they might say. I'm not saying that, but um, of the problems as opposed to the pure elimination of them. So let me can I, let me break that into three parts if I could. Just yes, sorry, it was a compound. The, new, the new stuff, <laughs> the new stuff, uh, the put, and then the money. Um, mm -hmm. With respect to the new stuff, the major problem is the stuff isn't new. What the commission identifies is a lease, um, a, a common investor protection that gives a passive investor. Uh, the decision whether to permit a lease of all or some of the assets, including license. The terms of that lease changed. You have to acknowledge uh, 
No, they, they did not. And I'm sorry, Judge Millett, to, to push back on you. But if you look at 6.11... The ordinary course of business limitation on their authority, DASH's authority still in or out? The ordinary course of business limitation, I think, sits alongside the lease of major assets. And lease of major assets wouldn't be in the ordinary course of business. So the, major the FDC, assets, I'm, I'm, how would that not be when the whole point of what they're trying to do here is build a network? If they wanted to lease them so they could build a network, that's their business. That seems to me quite the ordinary course of business. If it is a common investor protection, again, Judge Millett, to permit passive investors to have a say about whether a go vast back and it didn't change, the ordinary course of business language was eliminated, correct? They, I don't believe it was eliminated. I think it was added to. So I, I'll ref, let me refer you in the 2015 agreements, and then we can go on to the put, to JA 180 and 183. This is 6.11C which prohibits the petitioners from leasing all or substantially all. What document are you citing there? Um, that the, is- The opinion or? The... No, that's I think the LLC agreement, JA 180. And then section 6.18, a few pages later, and I, I see that I'm over time, but I hope you'll permit <laughs> me to finish fine. this yeah, hard answer. Um, 6.18, which is JA 183, mm -hmm prohibits lease of property or assets now owned or hereafter acquired by either petitioner, except in the ordinary course. Right. So that's the fact that that's still in the 2018 agreement. In that's the, the 2015 agreement. agreement. Right. Is that still in the 2018 agreement? What the 2018 agreement says is that the lease of uh, major assets is a significant matter requiring me? approval. Sorry. I'm, I'm reading JA 1664 note 140. Just give me a second to catch up to you, please. Yeah. Sorry, Same, tell me the JA, which page again? 1664, okay. Okay. note 140. Sorry. And that's, this is the FCC's characterization of the 2015 agreements. And what, one of the issues we have here is, of course, what they say in that first right. Judge Millet I, is- I still apologize. I'll, I'll give the time to answer. I promise they will. 1640. 1660, so have, sorry. sorry. 1664, no, note 140. And this is the, the major, while, while you're finding that, let me give a little context. Note this 130? is 140, note, note 140. The commission says in this footnote, just for the, for the benefit of others, if they haven't found it, under the 2015 agreements, the applicants could lease their spectrum without seeking DISH's approval. That is simply false. That is a premise, an underlying premise of the entirety. The question is that the limitation on DISH's veto authority still cabined by that ordinary course of business language under the 2018 agreement. So if you could point me to where that ordinary course of business language remains in the 2018 agreement, I think that would be most helpful to me. I will, I will try to find uh, during Ms. Flood's argument what, if, if or where that joint appendix site remains. But, but here's the more important point, I think, Judge Millett. Uh, as we say in our briefs, that the leasing of major assets and assets out leased outside the ordinary course of business, those are two different ways of saying the same thing. And more importantly, the FCC never acknowledged below that there was a prohibition on leasing. We can quibble about whether it's defined under significant matter or whether it's a lease in the ordinary course of business. A lease of all of the assets wouldn't be in the ordinary course. The more important thing is this leasing provision is a standard investor protection. And that gets me to my second point. So is a put. A put, as the fifth memorandum and order says, uh, this is paragraph 95. Not, the you're, you're, these aren't categorical rules. It's not that a put no, always not. just fine. And they had huge concerns about the put before all of the um, sort of hydraulic pressure that was going to be on SNR and North Star to exercise these puts because of their extraordinary indebtedness and constraints on their ability to commercially um, exercise these lights and develop these licenses. And they said, you can tell me factually how they're incorrect, but they said that pressure remains. So, so this that is wasn't, why, it, was re, it was redesigned, but it wasn't is, eliminated. This is why they are incorrect, Your Honor. And forgive me because that, that too, I think, requires a couple corrections. The sure. first is, as I said, a put 
is actually a standard designated entity protect, pr pr protection. That's what the fifth MONO said, paragraph 95. That was in 1994. The uh, colloquies that I think you're referring to in the prior oral argument, Judge Millett, if you look at them again, it's mostly Judge Pillard, if I remember correctly. Judge Pillard is talking about something the fifth MONO says, which is if the put in combination with other things, and you'll find this actually in a quote in the SNR decision itself, a put in combination with the management services agreement uh, and other capital contributions is greatly concerning. There has never been, never been an instance where the commission has found impermissible control with simply the existence of a put. And not only that, but Judge Pillard also made the point that perhaps the commission could permit, permit a correction to the put in the form of multiple puts, which the um, designated entities implemented, multiple larger windows, which the designated entities implemented. So Let what me, that reduces I, down to, sorry, Judge Edwards. Go ahead, finish up, I'm sorry. But I, I wanted, if I could, just to make the, the third point in response to Judge Millett's question, because I think it flows from this. What this reduces down to, if you look at the 2020 decision, is that the lease, which is a stand, least um, discretionary prohibition, which is a standard investor protection, the put, which is a standard item of fare in designated entity agreements, all of those are not uh, not useful or suitable here precisely because Judge Millett, there's so much money involved. But since you've read the transcript of the first argument, you'll also have seen that Ms. Flood mentioned at the time, that's not our argument. Our argument is not that the money uh, is the issue here, but every bit well, not of by the 20... Itself. Not, not by itself, but that's yeah. part of the problem, right? I mean, it's it's the put in combination with the money, but if the put isn't the problem, then the money is. And for the money to be an issue, that's I think how part... it works in multi-factor things. One, they didn't say it's just put in money, right? The put by itself or the money by itself. It was the put and the money and this time around, and they could be wrong. They could very well be wrong about this, but the put and the money and the way there was going to be all this building, building, building debt, building or building equities, so more and more, because they had all these obligations to pay to pay these dividends. If they didn't, they just got just kept getting more and more um, equity and these deadlines that would be coming on building out. Yes. Um, and the inability to a, a number of constraints on their ability to enter into leases or contracts to sort of build out this network. I, I, I don't think it's fair to say, I mean, you're, one of your fair notice concerns is this is um, such a sort of Rorschachian type uh, analysis with all these multiple yes. factors. So I don't think it's gonna be fair for any of us to sort of pin one and one and the other, but it was sort of that, she may have more to add to the list, but that sort of gestalt at least as to this investor, this aspect of the yes. investor protection. Let me, let yeah. me ask, sure. I, I would like to ask this, uh, in your reply brief, you are, I think, making the point that you're you're trying to wrap together here, but I want to make sure, so will you just amplify this a little bit so that I make sure I'm getting it? You say the commission has never before concluded that an investor protection provision gives an investor de facto control absent a management services agreement giving substantial day-to-day -day control to the investor. That is, that is correct, Judge Edwards. And that's something we also said, I believe, in our opening brief and invited the FCC to disagree with us. And that, I think, is part of the issue here that actually does um, map on to Judge Millett's question as well. There is a, a gestalt uh, aspect to this, right? Because of this totality of the circumstances analysis, what would have been so helpful are discussions with commission staff so that we can understand if or how to correct those things. And Judge Jackson, the discussions don't need to result in a cure. There could be a point where if commission staff puts uh, too much um, emphasis on an, uh, an aspect of the agreement that DISH simply won't accede to, then there's no designated entity status. But the important Jackson, let thing me ask is- you, Let me ask you, in this, in this allegedly unclear world uh, from uh, your client's perspective, um, why didn't your clients do more after um, after there was the opportunity to do more when there were comments that were made? So we had the remand and uh, you claim that the process wasn't sufficiently iterative, but you did submit your paperwork. And then um, 
my understanding is pursuant to the FCC's process, comments were made uh, concerning whether or not uh, you had met the mark. And at that point, your clients decided to stand on their submission and not make any changes. And I'm curious as to why that is, um, and, and therefore how you can support the claim that you would have even done more had there been more communication from F FCC staff. Certainly, and, and just, to, just to be clear on this, the comments that were made were not, of course, made by the commission staff or by the commission. They were yeah. submitted by other disgruntled large bidders. Um, but, but here's the real uh, heart of the matter. You know, in, in March of 2018, SNR actually sent a long letter to the commission saying, look, if, if you're not going to meet with us, here are a number of questions we have about how or whether or in what way we can correct for this totality of the circumstances analysis so that the totality of the circumstances don't add up to a finding of control. Um, and what the petitioners did when they finally submitted in June of 2018, Judge Jackson, they didn't just fix a couple things, as you know, they terminated the management agreement, they terminated the trademark agreement, they terminated the interoperability requirement, they lengthened the um, interest period, they converted a huge raft of debt to equity making these two petitioners much more highly leveraged than other DEs in the same auction. They uh, decreased the interest rate. They did a huge number of things. Of course, these disgruntled other big bidders were gonna come in and say, well, you should have done more. But at that point, under Baker Creek and under Intermountain Microwave and under Judge Edwards's point that never in the history of a DE has there been found to be control without the uh, management agreement also being present, these petitioners were entitled to think they had done enough. Nothing required them to right, further but if, amend. But, it, but if you are correct that they don't have to have the opportunity to actually mail it at the end of the day, then the FCC could make the determination on the totality of the circumstances test that all of the things that they had done, including the things that they changed and added, as Judge Millett pointed out, was still not enough. Right. I mean, right. And, and, and I have a question about the standard of review in terms of this court's analysis at this point. Isn't it that we have to give the FCC some deference? I mean, are we de novo now uh, evaluating the, uh, you know, whether or not we think you did enough under a totality of the circumstances test? So let me work backwards, Judge Jackson. The, the answer is, uh, the answer is yes, uh, this is a fresh analysis. Um, whether you look at this as a question of the mandate rule, whether you look at it as a question of the commission's compliance with 47 USC 402H, uh, which directs them that it shall be the duty of the commission to implement the court's mandate, or whether you look at this as just a simple administrative procedure exercise in which the commission, rather than being accommodating of this court's prior opinion, read it in the most miserly way possible and denied the opportunity that this court requested uh, these petitioners engage in. It's de novo review, but backing up to, to your point about the oppositions raising more questions, that is not an opportunity to cure. The party that has the cure power is not AT&T, it's not T-Mobile, and it's not Verizon, it's the commission. The commission was dead silent from 2017 through 2020. I mean, that's not an opportunity to, to cure. An opportunity to cure is your ability, and the curing is by you. Correct. It's not, it's not by the commission. And, and that we were very clear about that in SNR, that there's no obligation to end up permitting it at the end of the day. So yes, Judge Millett, but the, the, is what you're saying. The, the, the thing, sure. the opportunity to cure includes the, the opportunity to talk to staff about what a cure would look like. And remember, this is a protective discussion for the benefit of these small entities. Going back to that 2006 final rule, isn't I will quote language, the important. Ms. Stetson, in our case, isn't there language about renegotiating the contracts with DISH? There yes. is a line. That is the one change. line. Yes, yes. Okay. that, is, so that is the one line, but but it doesn't say negotiate a cure with DISH, right? It never says that. And again, I would I would point you back to that well, 2006. No, 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 it does. I mean, I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Judge Jackson, but- Yes, please. 1046 repeatedly, they say, 
Petitioners can contend, I'm in the, the right-hand column, that in the past, the FCC has compensated for lack of clarity by giving small companies a chance to modify their contractual agreements with large investors, right? In an yeah. effort to give the small companies enough independence. Petitioners seek precisely that kind of opportunity to modify their agreements with DISH. Yes. Right? Yes. The I FCC agree. didn't give clear notice that such an opportunity to modify your agreement with DISH, right? We renegotiate, we remand for them an opportunity to renegotiate their agreements with DISH, the appropriate remedy here. What I don't see anywhere in the opinion is saying you get to, um, other than once when they're describing your argument, that you get to go have sit downs, multiple sit downs, or even just one with the commissioners themselves. So Judge Millett, a, a couple answers. The first is the, the passages you just read, of course, don't include the word cure. Uh, the rest of the opinion speaks to right, but it just says the cure. cure. In fact, if I counted, it's like more than 20 something times. It yes. says cure, a cure, a cure. And I didn't see a single time, sometimes it did say negotiate occur, but there's no object for who that negotiation is with, Yes, um, but, which but, seems to be what this language on 1046 is answering. But I, I guess if for you, your argument that, that this was a miserly reading of the opinion, if you could point me to where they say, not in describing your argument, not in just describing uh, the clear care case, sorry, clear, clear calm, mm -hmm. <laughs> clear calm case, where in, in language of independent language of the court, they said that you have a right to negotiate with the commission or the bureau on this. Okay. Can you point to that language in the opinion? That language, that the <clears throat> precise language about negotiating with staff, of course, isn't in the opinion, but that's the point of the, of the court's site to clear comment. And here's something not to lose sight of as well. Does that become the binding backup. precedent when a panel when a panel cites to another case and describes its factual context, but never, despite having more than 20 something opportunities yeah. in the opinion to include that language never did. I think uh, Judge Millett, the reason they didn't feel like they needed to is because as, as Ms. Flood will confirm, it is standard for these discussions with staff to appear. <clears throat> this, is, this is not something that this court was prescribing. This court was instructing the commission to do the thing that the FCC in 2006, in that quote that I read earlier, does with respect to designated entities. It enters into discussions with designated entity applicants and the objectors, by the way, and the investors. Precisely so, people are in the room to discuss what changes, if necessary, could be made to the agreements to ensure that these designated entities actually have the protections that the FCC wants them to have. So Stephen, if you're they, right about if you're right about that, then why don't we have the very moral hazard problem that the court was concerned about and that it was focused on when it made its fair notice pronouncement? I actually think that the court wasn't concerned about the moral hazard problem, Judge Jackson. The court rejected the moral hazard argument um, that the FCC made the last time around. Precisely, precisely because it's that, but it rejected that argument precisely because it said that it doesn't, that the opportunity to cure doesn't mean you will actually ultimately get it. Yes, In other words, the but, moral but and we don't, yeah, hmm. sorry, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say the moral hazard problem arises if, as you suggest, the party has a ironclad opportunity to sit down with FCC staff and correct all of its deficiencies such that it will actually cure at the end of the day. Then you have a moral hazard problem because why would anybody make their best effort at the beginning when they know they have this opportunity at the end of the day to hear exactly from the decision makers what they need in order to make sure that their uh, arrangement satisfies the standards. So Judge Jackson, I think the answer is this is not, and we're not asking for an ironclad opportunity to sit down with staff and negotiate a solution and a cure to every last efficiency. We are looking for guidance from staff through those discussions that the commission has identified occur in control cases precisely to give these designated entities a little more leverage than they may have. This is not some kind of an ironclad guarantee of a cure. The point of the remand and the point of the commission's prior processes 
is to negotiate a cure, to find out what could change in this totality of circumstances, what could be put in or taken out that would change the way that those scales are levered. And remember too, this isn't just the kind of protective to the DE aspect that I mentioned, the timing of this matters. The way that these auctions are conducted all of these decisions and discussions occur after the bids are made and won. And so well, the reason that- because the, your bid, That's because your bidders made, an ob, made a commitment to pay full price on all the bid they made before they made those bids. They made an upfront commitment that they could pay the full price of what they are bidding. This process comes afterwards because you've already committed to pay that full price, but let's figure out whether we can give you a discount. We, right? we so have, it's, it's not like they're saying you might be or might not. You can plan, you know, you have to do some contingency in your predicting. They say, don't make the bid if you can't follow through on the full price. We submitted in the short form applications, of course, the, the grounds for designated entity status. You, you, um, you may have, but you made a commitment. Your, your clients made a commitment as well. Did they not to pay the full price of every bid that they made? Yes, and that's a point the commission made during the last oral argument as well. And I think the response of this court and the prior opinion was it is not fair notice for that huge commitment to be made without an opportunity to see yeah. as applicants have sought before discussions with staff. And I would suggest that uh, FCC counsel might be able to answer the question, the question that they never answer in their brief. They never even respond by the way, to the 2006 discussions language that I just read, which is, does the FCC do this or not? Do staff do this or not? And the answer is staff did this all the time. Now in more recent years, staff has said, and the commission has said, don't expect an opportunity, but staff did this all the time. So we don't need to go on some archeological dig through ClearCom or question. through this court's prior decision. Um, so I have two other questions. Or, sure. I know I interrupted you, Judge Jackson. Did you get? No, that's to, all right. Please. Um, uh, you you talk about um, that was interesting in the um, uh, investor protections here that there's a qualification that says you know, to the I'm paraphrasing. You can say more accurately, but to the extent allowable by the yeah. Bear, Baker Creek, Creek. Bear Creek Baker Creek. I don't know why I keep thinking Bear Creek Baker Creek decision. Um, and my question is if, say, SNR or North Star, <clears throat> forgive my language, um, my, my throat, um, if SNR or North Star um, wanted to enter into a lease for something and um, DISH says no, and there's a disagreement between them as to whether it would be consistent with, mm -hmm. would be allowed or not under Baker Creek, or would it be appropriate for DISH to say no under ba Baker Creek? Uh, who decides that? I think the answer is it's a it's a um, it's a process that wouldn't happen because the FCC was supposed to decide that. The reason that that language I don't understand began, what that means. That the means FCC... that even before that even before that conversation occurs that you're talking about, where SNR would come to Dish and say we would like to lease our spectrum in order to monetize this, mm -hmm. the FCC in looking at these amendments had the opportunity, you know, first of all, this all could have been solved by discussions, right? But had the opportunity to say that leasing provision in our view isn't consistent with Baker Creek, so we strike it. So if the FCC had I'm, done I'm, that wait job- minute, Wait a minute, I'm, I'm very confused. Okay. Um, you wanted um, these agreements approved as written. You think that, 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 that as written, your amended uh, agreements for, for both companies um, demonstrated um, that there was no longer sort of disqualifying control by DISH and they should be certified, okay? And you did it based on that language, okay? And now I'm saying, say, say if they had signed off and then two years later or a year later, this conversation, this disagreement comes up between North Star and um, uh, DISH as to whether they can lease out 60% mm -hmm. of their spectrum um, to some other company to help develop. Okay, you're saying the FCC will have already said whether as to that specific dispute. Hmm. 
That's what I don't understand how that works. That's what I'm trying to ask. So, I'm sorry. So let me you. let me clarify. Um, I, I think there's there's two, there's sort of a fork in the road when those amendments were submitted in June of 2018 to the commission, right? I think your hypothetical is presuming that those amendments were accepted as submitted. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that those amendments were accepted as submitted, that that standard investor protection was mm -hmm. found to be approved. As you wanted it to be. That's your whole yes, point yes. here on so the merits is that it should have, this should have been approved as written. Yes. And so I'm so saying, you, mean, say you won that. Say they you, said, okay, we agree with that. Yes. You wanted them to say agree with that. And then this happens. What happens then? I think then DISH would be exercising the right that any standard passive investor would have to say yay or nay as mm -hmm. to a lease of a significant amount of assets. That, okay. but, and then, that, but the point but North, is- No, 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 my, my, that's not our, our North Star, I forget what, how I did my hypothetical. North Star may say, wait, you're violating Baker Creek. We think we get to do this lease. No, your honor. I, I think the reason that that belt and DISH suspenders- would just, would have the final answer. The, as to whether because, something was consistent or not with Baker Creek. Exactly. Yes, because the FCC has already made that pronouncement. I think where you and I had had the disconnect. The FCC is has that already I, said that that DISH, if, if it signs off on this agreement, that if, if it's unclear, because all, all, all the agreement do is cite to the list of standards in Baker Creek, nothing more, not even its analysis. If there's disagreement about whether it's consistent with mm -hmm. Baker Creek, DISH wins. I think there are, in some circumstances, dispute resolution processes that haven't become relevant to this case, but I think that the disconnect the agreement that I have, I'm sorry? In the agreement itself as to this question? I don't know as to this question, Your Honor. This, this mm -hmm. hasn't become relevant to this case until this hypothetical, so I confess. Mm -hmm. But okay. I think the disconnect is that the reason that that language was in the amendments um, as submitted without the input of staff, looking at past auction recipients, uh, including this same auction, DE recipient status, looking at what the commission had previously said, looking at Baker Creek is, if we are wrong, tell us we are wrong and okay, write that, that reason point. provision. Right. I, have, so, I have one yeah. more question. Okay, and, and just to, if I could put one more point on that, the way that this all could have been cleared up is discussions. And then um, ascertainable certainty. Yes. Can you tell me, articulate for me exactly the definition or meaning of ascertainable certainty that you wish to have applied here? because we've articulated it different ways. Yeah. So what, is, what do you think is the right articulation of the ascertainable certainty test um, that we should apply? I think the right articulation, probably the, the closest uh, approximation to our standard is the, is the DC Circuit's general electric opinion. Um, ascertainable certainty means that a regulated entity is able to look at the actions of an agency and determine whether its actions fall inside or outside of the fair and foul line. Um, and that, that gets to the very end of our brief and the substantive fair notice argument that we have, the point that Judge Edwards made some minutes ago, which is even if you get past uh, the problem with the remand, the problem with the lack of communication, the problem with the new control finding that wasn't based on the old control finding, you are left with a control finding that these entities had no understanding how to determine with any ascertainable certainty would happen precisely for the reason we discussed. Never in the history of the designated entity program has control been found without a put plus something. That was the issue of the DC. I, what I don't understand is how the ascertainable certainty standard can encompass more than knowledge of the standards or the test that will be applied by the agency. You seem yeah. to suggest that in order to have ascertainable certainty, you have to know exactly how that standard is going to be applied and therefore whether you will win at the end of the day. And that yeah. you, if, you, if you lose, you have no fair notice because you looked at the standard and thought you might win. I, I, I don't understand how you get away from um, that unfortunate set of circumstances that seems to undermine all of, you know, judicial notice and, and litigation and that kind of thing. 
I think it's an unusual set of circumstances, but not necessarily um, you know, unheard of. But it, there are two problems I think that contribute to this. The first is of course, the totality of the circumstances standard, um, because that standard in the FCC's hands in this decision and in 2015 became essentially anything that FCC wanted it to. The, but isn't, the, I'm sorry, the, isn't the totality of circumstances pretty standard in uh, you, you know, application across all sorts of circumstances? It is, it is Judge Jackson, but that's why you look for footholds in other places, right? That's why you look to Baker Creek to see what are the investor protections that have been found to be okay. That's why this court actually in 2017 said, with respect to the fifth memorandum opinion and order that paragraph 95 that I mentioned, there was fair notice that a put option in combination with a management service agreement and capital contribution is potentially a problem. That is the kind of fair notice that we're talking about, but here, when you've never had the commission when you have case say, by case, just an agency agencies can make law through case by case adjudication, right? Yes, and they yes. can do that here as well. There's nothing about this area that forbids making law through case by case adjudication. No, I mean that's what the commission said in 20, 2006. So even when if it they haven't about encountered questions. a particular problem in the past, when they encounter a new problem, as long as there was, this is where I think your action is, of course, as long as there was sufficient notice as to the standard and the concerns that they would be looking for, even if not the particular factual scenario, that would, right, this isn't qualified immunity analysis, right? No, we aren't, no, we aren't looking not. for an exact fact pattern that has been, you know, approved. Upheld by the before. Supreme Court, right? right. No, that, exactly. This is not qualified immunity. Right. But I think, you know, part, part, of, part of the issue here, too, is the commission's, um, you know, this, just instruction that folks not look to anything other than commission decisions for guidance. But what we're left with in combination with those timing issues we talked about, which of course played a central role in the court's prior opinion, is a situation where you commit the money, as you said, Judge Millett, then you have the examination of the control status, then you have, precisely because of this totality of the circumstances analysis, you have discussions with staff to figure out where the minefields are, where the problems are, and then if you can cure them- Yes, but it's not an unfair thing. It's, you know, you, you've committed to pay the full amount, and then they say afterwards, we'll look and see if you qualify for the special status. And all they did, they didn't, they didn't sanction you for not qualifying for special status. They sanctioned you for violating your obligation, your commitment to pay full price for all the bids that you made. And so all they're doing here at post hoc is, um, is saying, maybe we can get you a discount. Um, but when they don't, then you still had already, I mean, that'd be, you know, that'd be icing on the cake, but you had already made a representation to pay all of these bids. Judge Millett, you, you began that question by saying it's not about fairness, but the, the prior panel, of course, said that that's exactly what it's about. Prior for, panel said, whereas here, here. Right. hundreds of millions of dollars are at stake. Regulated parties need fair notice of the circumstances in which a finding of de facto control will and will not be subject to an opportunity to cure. Mm -hmm. The issue here, the combination of the timing plus the money, plus the uh, commission's consistent practice right up- The amount of money doesn't office. matter, right? The amount of money is not a determinant factor. The amount of money we would say is not the determinant factor. In fact, you know, as I pointed out earlier, these petitioners are actually much more highly leveraged than other designated entities have been in this auction and others. The amount of money just means the spectrum that they hold is incredibly valuable. That's the point of the amount of money and value means assets and equity and everything that the designated entities need in order to make this work. The fair notice is because these entities were not given a chance simply to have a discussion with staff about how to cure things. And as I said, we don't need to go back and do a dig through the, the court's prior opinion even to find that. The commission itself in 2006 told us Got it. That these discussions happen. Do my colleagues have any further questions? We've kept, we've kept you up a little bit over your time here. Yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you very much for your assistance. We'll give you some time on rebuttal. Thank you. May it please the court, Maureen Flood for the Federal Communications Commission. I'd like to start with a fair notice point. 
This court in its 2017 opinion found that the petitioners had fair notice that the commission would find the petitioners under the de facto control of DISH. Now with the benefit of the same rules and the same precedent that the petitioners had before, plus a lengthy commission order and a court decision, plus comments from parties of record in the proceeding below, petitioners had more than fair notice of how to comply with the commission's control rules and precedent and how to demonstrate that they were no longer under the de facto control of DISH. Well, what's your Ms. response? Ms. Flood, can I, I I'm just ask you the matter that's of principal concern to me as I'm looking at this case. In my understanding of administrative law cases, and this goes across the board, totality of circumstances is always a loose, uh, a loose standard, and it can be troublesome depending upon how it's applied. It can mean a lot. It can mean very little. Uh, and my understanding has been in all the years I've been doing this, the totality of the circumstances is always defined by reference to agency practice. And that's what gives the affected parties some understanding of what is within and without the totality of circumstances. If it is true, as the other side says, that the commission has never before concluded that an investor protection provision gives an investor de facto control absent a management services agreement giving substantial day-to-day -day control to the investor, how can you get it here? That makes no sense to me. And, and it really is no answer to me to say, well, but the commission is not precisely bound. They can do whatever they want and it doesn't matter what staff resolves. Uh, if it is true that the cases come out of the commission have resulted in a scenario in which there's never been, however it's done, there has never been a finding of de facto control where you have investor protection uh, provisions, uh, but you do not have a management services agreement giving any substantial day-to-day -day control. Why should it happen here? Because, Your Honor, the petitioners, the commission told the petitioners in the 2015 order that consistent with our application of the Intermountain Microwave Test, this is a six-factor test, that the commission could find control even if it only found problems under some but not all of those six factors. And as we explained in our brief, and we explained in the order, elimination of the management services agreement only cured the commission's previously identified control concerns under two of- What is it that, what is it they had reason to know that would make a difference? Because your honor, the commission had told them- No, but I mean, what what is it in the totality of the circumstances that they, got any indication that would cause them to, we sent the case back. We don't normally send a case back like this unless we're concerned that the affected party, the challenging party really doesn't get what's required. I mean, that's the key to me here. We don't send a case like this back with a long, long, long opinion with lots of things saying that the FCC is right on this the FCC is right on that, their FCC is right on this, but you know what? We're sending it back. You know what the but was? The but was, in my view, when I read that decision and listen to the arguments here, the but was they don't really understand what it is they need to do under this totality of the circumstances test to cure whatever problem it is that the FCC has in mind. Your Honor, because what they have in mind is not being revealed. And I don't think you win in an administrative law case if that's the scenario. And I mean, there's lots of areas of law where that's in play all the time. Totality of the circumstance is great when the agencies want to fling it around and say, that's all we have to tell you. We can weigh everything. That's total nonsense. You can't invariably weigh everything. You have to explain to parties what counts on the scale and what does not count on the scale. And they have to have a fair understanding of that. You don't have to handhold them all the way through the process. I'm not disagreeing with you there, but they have to be able to find some indication of what will make a difference and why. And if they are right, that we have an in, in, investor protection provisions that never has resulted in de facto control finding from the FCC, never where there has not been uh, the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, 
management services agreement. Never. And you're not refuting that. Then I'm not getting it. Because, Your Honor, there were problems under four of the other six Intermountain Microwave factors identified in 2015 that have nothing to do with the management services agreement. So, for example, the money was a huge issue and petitioners' overwhelming financial obligations to DISH, in addition to DISH's ability to stymie their ability to pay off their debt. So for example, it was very clear in the 2015 order that the commission was concerned that DISH could prevent the petitioners from monetizing their licenses by building out networks and generating revenue that they could use to pay off their debt to DISH. Eliminating the management services agreement doesn't do anything to resolve that concern. The commission was concerned about the fact that petitioners, this was in the 2015 order, that petitioners could not exit the business without DISH's consent. The petitioners knew that going into the cure proceeding, what did they do? They consented to a restriction that would that basically barred them from selling their licenses to any competitor of dishes, even though those are the only potential buyers of the licenses. The commission expressed concern in the 2015 order that the petitioners would never make a profit from their licenses because they would first have to pay off their debt to dish, which dish could prevent them from doing, and only after they did that would they be able to generate a profit, and that was unlikely. So all of these issues, you're asking me what fair notice they had. The fair notice they had was the commission's analysis under the 2015 order. And as we thoroughly explained in the order on review, eliminating them, and we gave them credit. We gave them credit under two of the six intermountain microwave factors for eliminating the management services agreement. But petitioners did not, the elimination of the management services agreement in and of itself did not do anything to resolve the clearly identified problems under the four other intermountain microwave factors. And in fact, petitioners in their brief barely grapple with our intermountain microwave analysis. All they do is say, well, we got rid of the management services agreement. That's enough. But as we explained, yeah. that's not enough. Can you help me understand or explain how the fifth memorandum opinion and order from 1994, and I'm thinking about paragraphs 95 and 96, um, which talks about puts and when puts with other terms of an agreement um, will uh, can be found to, to establish de facto control. Can you explain to me uh, your view, I mean, the commission's view on whether or how that provided fair note, the terms of those paragraphs, or if there's else, you can look elsewhere too, but the, sure. these are the ones I found, but if there's others, you can point those to two. I don't mean to combine you to that, but did that provide, did that give notice or not? Relevant. It did, well, Your Honor, the commission's 2015 order and the court's decision gave petitioners fair notice. I mean, there's the precedent, the court in the, in the SNR wireless decision. No, I understand well, your argument about that. Sure. What I'm trying to say but is, our, but our, you know, as the argument is to whether you have to have, you know, a management contract thing, as I read it, it says whether put options in combination with other terms to an agreement deprive an otherwise qualified control group of de facto control over, they're doing it in the negative there, right? So sure. whether it deprived them. So what does that signify if you have a put option and other terms of an agreement? And it doesn't have to be, I think they do, for example, management orders, but it doesn't have to be. Because this is foot written in the negative, <laughs> this is when it's not finding control, I'm having trouble. Um, Stepping back. That wanna, sure. So focusing on those paragraphs, does it, Sure. Does it or does it not alert folks that a put agreement combined with other terms of an agreement that are going to force or are some level of likelihood force a sale by the designated entities? Sure. Petitioners had more than fair notice of our finding under the fifth memorandum opinion and order based on our 2015 order and the court's decision. The commission's point in the, re in the remand order was that the petitioners had not identified any of the problems with the put that we had previously identified because they didn't make any material changes to the put right in their agreements. 
I mean, in the 2018 agreements or in the context of the 2018 agreements, you have the same situation that you had before. I mean, same story, different day, which is that the essentially what happened, there are three things that happen. First of all, DISH is still allowed to control when and how petitioners use their licenses, which determines whether or not the petitioners can pay off their massive financial obligations to DISH. Two, the financial obligations are still massive. They might have changed the form of their debt but the amount of it is still the same. And because of that, and because of a new dividend requirement, when you combine the debt with the dividend, which petitioners as startup companies with no revenue are never going to be able to pay, and turns into preferred equity, which functions like debt and must be paid off first at liquidation, you end up in the same place that you did before, where the petitioners are never going to be able to turn a profit. So if you're sitting there under those circumstances and you're looking at the put rights, and I mean, the put rights changed, I mean, the changes are superficial. They have two put rights now rather than one, and the window stays open longer, but that's it. So if you look at those circumstances and you're led to the same place that the commission was at and the court was at in the first phase of this case, which is that the petitioners have an overwhelming incentive to exercise the put right or just to sell their licenses to DISH down the road because it's the only way that they can avoid certain financial failure. If you're in a situation where you can take the generous rate of return on the put right without having to meet any of your construction deadlines and without having to pay off your, dish, your debt to DISH, of course you would do that. Of course you would do that. And the commission was also looking at this in the context of the fact that the petitioners are now six years into their license term with their build out milestones quickly approaching. And let's talk about that for a second. In order for the petitioners to keep their licenses by October of 2025, each of those licenses has to provide service to 70% of the population covered by the license. If they don't, they default back to the commission. With those construction deadlines looming and no, no construction, no use of the licenses to date, the commission reasonably found that the petitioners would exercise the put right. So Ms. Flood, can I just um, paraphrase what I thought I heard you say right there, just so I can make sure that I get it. Um, I thought I heard you say, that in the prior order, the FCC made clear that the control problem was that the way these arrangements were organized, the only way to avoid certain financial failure on the part of these companies was to exercise their put right. That you had a situation that when, when everything was combined, the fact that DISH was uh, uh, controlled when and how the, the, these companies could use their licenses, they, they had this massive debt to dish and they had this attractive foot right, that that was the circumstance that created control. And that notice then was given that if they were gonna cure, they would have to address those issues. And the FCC's position here today is that they knew that and they didn't address them sufficiently. Am I, yes. is, is that a fair yes. summary yes. of your argument? Yes. Okay. Yes, I mean, and, and as we explain at length, um, as we explain at length in the order, in order to resolve our previously articulated concerns under the guidance in the fifth memorandum opinion and order, the petitioners would have to make material changes to the agreements. And the changes they made to the put right were superficial. And because they did not make material changes that resolve the clearly articulated terms. And you remember the court in his last decision said that the fifth memorandum opinion in order clearly presaged the commission's control finding. The commission found once again that the petitioners were under DISH's control under the fifth memorandum opinion in order guidance. You know, I also just wanna go back and point out something. Judge Edwards expressed concern about the fact that the commission in the past has never found control when there hasn't been a management services agreement, that goes to the commission's holding that the petitioners were under the control of DISH, under the Intermountain Microwave factors. As the commission pointed out, that's separate and apart from our analysis of control under the fifth memorandum opinion and order. So if the court disagrees with our Intermountain Microwave analysis, and you shouldn't because our decision is reasonably and reasonably explained, but if you don't, the court could still affirm the commission under the fifth memorandum opinion in order because the rulings are distinct. And the management services agreement wasn't a factor 
in our analysis under the Fifth Memorandum Opinion and Order in 2015, and it wasn't again in 2018. What's your response to Ms. Stetson's sort of initial point that perhaps, um, you know, that wasn't clear enough um, for, for her clients and that the commission really was obligated under this court's prior ruling to sit with them and explain, explain that really what the issue is here is the way in which you've created um, a situation that is a, a, a carrot and a stick and a sort of Damocles, for example, uh, uh, for, for the clients and that that's what needed to be addressed. She says procedurally, the commission staff needed to respond to their calls and explain how they could have cured. Why is she wrong about that? Because nothing in the, for several reasons, Your Honor, but the first one, and I think this came out during your exchange with counsel for petitioners, is that nothing in the court's opinion requires that. I mean, it clearly says at page 1046 of the opinion that what the court wanted the petitioners to have, the remedy of the court wanted the wanted petitioners to have the opportunity to renegotiate their agreements with DISH. Nowhere in the opinion does the court describe the cure opportunity as an opportunity to renegotiate with the commission. And that makes sense because the agreements that gave rise to the control finding were the agreements between the petitioners and DISH. Presumably, I mean, the commission, and we point this out in our briefs and in the order, the commission has great discretion under section 4J of the act to order its own proceedings. And this court's practice is to leave remand procedures to the agency. So if the court in its last decision was gonna take the extraordinary step of telling the commission how to conduct its remand, presumably it would have described the procedures in its decision. I also wanna make a distinction here. Council for Petitioners uses staff and the commission interchangeably, and she refers to the ClearCon procedures. There's an important distinction there. The reason that any interactions between the applicant and ClearCon and the staff took place because that application was being handled by the commission staff. The commission delegated it down to the commission's wireless bureau to handle it here. That, that, that's true. We understand that case law. Nonetheless, you got to understand that it dulls our brains some when we look at the agency and one part of the agency is allowing something and another part of it, that, that, that's not impressive. But you, you're right. You generally have the case law on your side. Uh, but, but don't think we're not affected by that. You're all in the same building, so to speak. Right. And, and if some, wait, if some parties are coming out advantaged, so to speak, and other parties are not coming out in the same way, a judge by definition is going to say, gee, that's troublesome. It's the same agency. Do they not talk to one another? But in any event, let me, let me ask you one thing to make sure, see if I'm getting you right. If I'm understanding your argument, it is essentially that an overwhelming, that, that they should have understood that an overwhelming incentive to exercise the put right ends the analysis. Under the fifth memorandum opinion in order, yes, Your Honor. In this case, place. that ends the analysis. They should have control If you have an overwhelming, if I'm hearing you correctly, if I'm trying to tease out, I'm really mundane in this way. I like to tease out straightforward uh, principles of law if I can. I hear, What I hear you saying through all this maze is, we told them before, and we're telling them again, if there's an overwhelming incentive to exercise that put, there's control, and that's it. Case is over. That's and we think, on the, we think on the facts of this case, there's clearly an overwhelming incentive to exercise the put. We did, and we found an overwhelming incentive to exercise the put because they didn't, they had fair notice, they didn't identify, or they didn't resolve problems that have been clearly identified by the commission in 2015. No, no, but I'm just identify. trying to, if we wrote anything, it seems to me that's what you would really want it. Now in the totality of the circumstances test, if the court finds in reviewing the agency that the, the agency was correct in finding there was an overwhelming incentive to exercise the put, that's the end of it. We don't have to go to any other factors that ends it. That's the legal principle that governs. That's what you're saying, right? 
Yes, and under the sure. under the standard review, I mean, it's a very deferential standard review. I mean, in the past case. No, no, no. I get all of that. Okay. I just want to make sure you're saying that's dispositive. You don't have to go through factors seven, twelve, or anything else. If you find that, your honors, we win. If we are right on that finding, we win. We do. You would not have. I mean, but we also were correct under. I don't want to give up and say that we weren't also correct under Intermountain Microwave. Judge Jackson, can I go uh, back? Ms. Blood, I'm sorry. Before you leave that, because I'm a little confused by <laughs> Judge Edwards' framing of this. <laughs> My understanding is that you made that finding the first go round, and that this court actually upheld it. In other words, that you looked at the agreements that previously existed that under the fifth m and uh, or whatever you said, there's the put right incentive, it's too great. And that's one of the reasons why we're finding control and that the original panel agreed. They upheld your substantive view of that, but they said the other side, the petitioners should have had an opportunity to make changes to their agreements to solve that problem. You then went back and said, here's the procedures for you having the opportunity to make those changes. And when you looked again at the renegotiated agreements with DISH, you said you haven't solved the problem that we previously identified and that the, the, the Court of Appeals actually affirmed us substantively with respect to that issue. Am I wrong about that? No, you're right. I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm just trying to understand yeah. You're heavily resting on that. I'm trying to understand what your argument is. And as I sit here listening, that's the essence of your argument. We told them it before, they didn't fix it, and they still lose. But that's bottom line, you're saying that's it. That's this case. You're saying that's one route. I'm saying <laughs> that's one yeah. route. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to let her, she can answer however she wants. I'm just, I want her to understand what I'm hearing. What I'm hearing is that's the crux of this case. There's an overwhelming incentive to exercise the put right. That's control, period. We told them that before. They didn't fix it. They lose. We'll take that. We also think we won under Intermountain Microwave, but ja Judge Jackson's articulation of, of what of my argument is much better than mine, so I'm going to rest on that. But I, Judge Jackson, I wanted to go back for one second. My point that I was making about the fact that the commission was going to decide, decide this and not the Bureau is as follows. It is well established, I and mean, this court reiterated this in the, in the SNR wireless decision, that the commission is not bound by the informal guidance provided by its staff. So this is why I think it's important to make the distinction between ClearCom and the other applications that the petitioners rely on in their brief, all of those were decided by on delegated authority by the commission staff. Here, the commission was deciding it. So the commission had already provided petitioners substantial guidance on how to cure their control problems. Where that put us was, even if the commission had directed the petitioners to sit down with the staff, the, the staff couldn't provide any more guidance than the commission had already provided. And even if the staff sit da sat down with petitioners and negotiated terms and proposed those to the commission, the commission could still disregard them. So I mean, the petitioners here aren't similarly situated to any other applicant that came before them. Because here- so, so, it, so even in, even in the sort of terms of Judge Millett's prior discussion in terms of agency practice, to the extent that the petitioners here are pointing to ClearCom as a prior practice, that right. was at most, you would say, a practice of what the staff would have thought about the circumstances. ClearCom can't possibly establish precedent for what the commission itself would have said. That's absolutely right. And, you know, the um, Petitioner's Council makes much of our of the commission statement in one of its prior orders about the fact that it's our usual practice to have our staff sit down and talk about control problems with a bidding credit applicant. It's our usual practice because that's because in most instances, these applications are handled on delegated authority. Here, the commission reasonably determined that in a case involving 13 billion dollars in spectrum licenses and 3.3 billion dollars in bidding credits it was going to handle it itself and you remember the first order the commission evaluated petitioners bidding credit eligibility in the first case 
Now with the judicial remand, of course the commission is going to keep that decision to itself. And given that the commission isn't bound by the decisions of its staff, why would the commission direct the petitioners to sit down, or why would the commission direct its staff to sit down with the petitioners and, and hash out terms? I just want to point something out. Yeah, I mean, something. I just, I'm getting a little confused here. Yeah. Why would the commission direct its staff? Are you talking about direct commission staff or are you treating like here the wireless bureau? Are you including them within your staff? I'm getting rather confused. I'm sorry, when I'm talking okay, about all your staff, staff I'm talking about the staff in the wireless bureau. So I'm not talking about the commissioner's personal staff, like the advisors to the commissioners. What the petitioners wanted is they wanted, and I apologize, it's being too inside baseball, and I apologize for the, the confusion. To clarify, what the petitioners wanted was they wanted to sit down with staff in the wireless bureau to hash out terms. And you know, you could see a discussion of this. It's in paragraph 24 of the remand procedures order. We cite a pleading filed by the petitioners. The petitioners wanted to sit down with wireless bureau staff over a series of meetings that take place by their estimate that would take more than a year to actually rewrite the terms in their agreements. So in other words, what would happen is they would come in with their agreements and the staff would get out the blue pencil <clears> and mark everything <throat> up. And the petitioners anticipated that that would take more than a year. But in fairness, that, it's in fairness, Ms. Flood, uh, there, there are so many variations on that notice argument. I think what they're really saying in fairness is they wanted to get a sense of how folks at the FE, FCC thought that they might avoid the appearance of overwhelming ins incentive. That's clearly what they're talking about. So give us your best sense. Now we may not, you still may not make it, but it, it, if I'm an attorney, I would like to be able to sit with FCC, anyone in the FCC. We got a problem here with this put. We don't want to look like we have an overwhelming incentive. Do you have any suggestions? We may or may not take them. We know the commission won't be bound by what you're telling us but give us some guidance because the totality of circumstances test can be utterly ridiculous in some cases. The one thing we know is this put thing is a problem. Do you have any way we can avoid this problem? That's not useless. Your Honor, the standard here, and I, I hate saying this because you know this, I mean, you know, you've written a lot about administrative law, but the standard here is, is this an abuse of discretion? And the commission did not abuse its discretion in determining that it shouldn't require that there was no need to require a staff to sit down with a petition no 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 i have more I, guidance about how to I, I i understand your formal argument and for the most part your formal argument is strong uh in terms of what procedures we can tell the commission they had to follow on remand i'm not generally i'm just a little concerned that you're overstating your position and suggestion there's nothing to be gained by allowing petitioners on a remand in a huge case with a lot of money where one issue is huge and overriding. And all I want to do is talk to some folks to get some guidance how you can avoid uh, the appearance that's bothering the uh, commission. I think it's ungenerous to suggest there's nothing to that. I think that's ridiculous. You're a smart lawyer. The other side has smart lawyers. I'm a smart lawyer, and I don't, I don't agree with it. There is something to be gained by that. Can we write that in the law? Probably not, but there's definitely something to be gained. Definitely. Your Honor, there might be, you might think there's something to be gained, and the petitioners obviously think there's something to be gained, but the commission did not abuse its discretion here in finding that there wasn't enough I hear to you. be gained. I hear you. Can, Can I, I just... Oh, please go ahead and then... I oh, I was going to say, Judge Millat, you were asking about the leasing restriction, and I actually have a page for you to look at if, if you want to go back to About that. the what restriction? The leasing restriction. Right. You were asking whether or not the ordinary course of... If I remember correctly, you were asking whether the ordinary course of business exception was in the... was in, was retained right. in the 2018 agreements, and it wasn't. So if you look at or at least not as relevant to the commission's analysis. If you look at page 1047 of the joint appendix, um, the petitioners put in a red line of the 2015 agreement. Hang on, let me catch up, let me catch up. Sure. <laughs> no problem. I'm gonna get the right volume here. All right, can you repeat the page, Ms. Blood? Sure, sure. It's, um, it's joint appendix page 1047. Thank you. Okay. 
Sorry. Okay, so if you look at, this is um, section 6.18 of the credit agreements. So it's a red line. So it starts with the language from the 2015 agreement and then the, the red line changes reflect the changes that were made in the 2018 agreement. So as originally written, this provision said, uh, the loan party agrees that sh it shall not without the prior written approval of the lender, which approval may be withheld, da 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 da, da lease, transfer otherwise dispose of this property or asset now owned or hereafter required. Okay, what the petitioners did, so what under their own reading, what that means is because they're reading property or assets to also cover licenses, what that means is before it was amended, the petitioners could not lease their licenses without DISH's prior written approval unless it was in the ordinary course of business. Mm -hmm. They amended the language so it says, property or assets now owned or hereafter acquired except for the sale of non-major assets in the ordinary course of business. So what they did was they amended the language so that now that ordinary course of business exception to the prior written approval requirement only applies to the sale of non-major assets. What the commission was concerned about was the lease of major assets because major assets include licenses. So the, the ordinary course of business exception, which even under the petitioner's own interpretation of their agreements, would allow the petitioners to lease their licenses in the ordinary course of business without DISH's prior written approval, that was in 2015, it no longer applies now. And that was the commission's point in finding that the leasing restriction was new. I mean, the petitioners don't dispute that they change or they add in language about what a major asset is in the 2018 agreements that wasn't there before. It defines a lease of a spectrum, it defines a spectrum license as a major asset. And so the commission looked at the terms in the 2018 agreements and said, wow, okay, so before the lease restriction didn't expressly cover licenses and there was this ordinary course of business exception, why did you amend your agreements in 2018 so the lease restriction now expressly covers licenses and you've eliminated this ordinary course of business exception, when to their point, leasing wasn't an issue. Before. I also want to point out this, this notion that the commission will move the goalposts on leasing. The reason the commission looked at leasing is because it was doing its job. The petitioners made leasing an issue when they were rebutting the, um, the comments filed by opponents of their applications. They came in and it was their expert that said, no, they are not likely or it's not inevitable that they will exercise the put right because among other things, they can monetize their licenses through leasing. So the commission looked at that and said, okay, well, can they lease? So we looked at the 2018 agreements and we saw the language that said effectively, if they wanted to lease any of their licenses, they would have to get prior written approval from DISH. And then we went back and looked at the 2015 agreements and we said, wow, they seem to have lost discretion in 2018 that they had in 2015. And the commission found that to be significant. Well, Ms. Stetson was right. The ordinary course of business language is still there. So I apologize, but um, it doesn't function the same way it did. It does not the function the same way. Concluding, she may have a different reading of it. That this was a commission's conclusion. It does not function. My, Unless the court has any questions. I, I, just I, 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 have a, I do have sure. a question. And this gets back to the role of the Bureau, um, uh, because um, you know, it, is, it is really hard for companies trying to navigate this space um, with the totality of circumstances tests or divining uh, the converse meaning of the order, the fifth memorandum opinion and order. Um, and it gets even harder when the commission allows its wireless bureau, which is probably quite expert in this area, to issue approvals of agreements as, for the status of being a designated entity without any explanation. And as best public can tell from whatever they're able to piece together, it looks, it looks this, I mean, their argument is it's the same. They're talking about AWS. They'll tell me if I've got the wrong ones, but AWS, these are the post-2015 ones, AWS, Bitco, and Advantage Spectrum. Um, and when all the commission goes is, oh, that was just our little bureau. It, that seems a bit too dismissive 
um, because that's a source of guidance and information. They are real decisions with real legal consequence and op practical consequence. And so um, was the, did the commission just say, we're not bound by the Bureau because it had nothing more to say as to those? And if that's true, isn't that a problem? Your Honor, the court in the prior case held that the commission can't be bound by the decisions of its staff because those one word grants don't provide any reasoning behind them. I mean, the commission- They're your agent. They're your they agent. are agent, yes, Your Honor. But, but Your Honor, but in section five of the act, Congress established that the commission can delegate matters to its staff, but that the commission is not bound by the decisions of its yeah, staff. Yeah, be bound it's by them, but are, are, are they- relevant? Are, are parties supposed to be able to look at those and at least try to divine some guidance as to meeting these standards that you have? Or is your position when you say we're not bound um, that you can look all you want? It's, you know, 50-50 whether we will agree or not at the end of the day. That seems You're like on. a very harsh environment in which to expect companies to operate. It's not, Your Honor. I mean, as I will respond, my response is this court's opinion in the prior case where the court at length- You said you're not bound by them, but that's a different thing from the commission saying, tell me if I'm wrong here, I'm like, we're not bound by them. Um, but when we leave them in place, don't pay them any attention. You can, nobody can rely on them. Your Honor, and that's an aspect of the reasoning in this case that I find troubling. Your Honor, but if if parties know that the commission is two things, if, if parties know and petitioners should know, because the court in the prior case told them that the commission is not bound by the decisions of the staff. Yeah, be they bound, but the are commission meant to inform. Are these meant to be informed? Can can people learn from those decisions? No, they can't, Your Honor, because they can't. I mean, for multiple reasons, as the court pointed so out. The AWS Bidco decision, I don't know if it is. We don't have an explanation. We don't have a full record. I don't know everything that the Bureau was looking at in those cases. But if, I, if, I, if I'm going to offer a hypothetical, and we're going to say it's <clears throat> the XXX company, and let's imagine their facts are identical. Their agreement is identical to the one that was proposed in 2018 here by North Star and SNR. And if the Bureau says, fine, go get your bidding credits on an identical agreement, is it rational for the commission to say, or is it even permissible for the commission to say, we're fine, we're gonna say the opposite here and we're good with having complete inconsistency in our internal decision-making. Your Honor, can I ask you a clarifying question about your hypothetical? Is it the same agreement or is it the same agreement and the companies are in the same circumstances? I mean, are they the identical company? And identical I'm going to tell you, it's the same, they're, they're not the same company. Of course, they can't get a different right. answer in two places, but they, the facts are all, all the material facts. There'll be a different names for the companies, who the companies are is different, but the material facts, every material fact cited by the commission in its decision here is the same. And well, Your Honor, presumably if, the, presumably if the material facts were the same and the agreements are the same, then the bidding credit application would be granted to party number two. But I mean, that's not what happened here. I mean, going no, no, back, why would it be? You just said, I, I'm assuming one is decided by the Bureau and one yeah. is decided by the commission. And the commission is not bound by what. So the Bureau goes first in hypothetical case with the companies XXX. And they go, okay, this is not, we don't find a de facto or de jure control problem here. And then <laughs> SNR and Wire and, 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 North, and North Star come and they have, they go, wait, that worked. We are going to copy that, cut and paste, change the names of the companies, um, but all the material facts are the same and the terms of the agreement are the same. And they come to the commission and the commission says, no. How is that because, Your Honor, because, Your Honor, the commission retains the right, the commission retains the right to determine that its staff got it wrong. I mean, under your hypothetical, the agreements could be the same and the petition, it, both applicants can be in the same position, but the commission is the ultimate decision maker. I mean, you have, any way, to that, so, pardon me? You have any way to distinguish AWS, Bidco, or Advantage Spectrum? 
I don't, Your Honor, because as we, as the court pointed out in its prior opinion, there's no, there's no bureau decision explaining why those applications were granted. I don't, I, you know, this was, this was the court's point in the prior case. How can the commission I'm come in and say, in Sorry. following up on Judge Millett's point in a couple of ways, in a situation in which the Bureau says this looks good to us, in the actual process, the way that it works, does the Commission ultimately sign off on every Bureau determination? No, Your Honor, the Commission does not the Commission does not review them. Under Section 5 of the Act, what essentially happens is the Commission can delegate matters for its staff to handle. And when the staff disposes of it and issues a decision, or in this case, an administrative grant of a bidding credit application, that has the force of law unless it's challenged up to the commission. So the All right, so we, don't really, so we don't really have the conflict that I think Judge Millett was alluding to with her hypothetical because the commission has not said in uh, scenario one, yes, we agree with our staff on these facts. And then in scenario two, it comes to them individually without the staff and they say something different. We don't know what the commission actually would have held, except when it comes to it in, in, in the second instance, right? I mean, I- That's correct. And also the commission doesn't know why the bureau held what it did. So that even if, even if, we have a world in which the Bureau's representations and views are meant to inform the commission. Let's assume that the Bureau did give all of its reasons, it laid it all out and there it was. And it says in that scenario, we believe there is no control, everything is fine. Even if that is the case, I think the question here would be whether the commission abused its discretion in saying that we don't need that information. We're gonna, we're gonna take this one ourselves. We don't need to hear from the, from the Bureau because it seems as though Ms. Stetson's argument was the commission had to send it to the Bureau and have the Bureau make a, you know, work with right. the parties and come up. So is there a world in which the commission could say, no, no, because of the amount of money, because of the scenario, we're gonna handle this one ourselves and we're not going to designate the Bureau to sit down with you and come up with its own informative uh, determination as to what should happen here. Yes, Congress granted us that authority in Section 5 of the Act. The Commission can determine what it's going to delegate to its staff, and the Commission can decide when it wants to keep something for itself. When they delegate authority, can an appeal be taken from the Bureau? An appeal cannot be taken from the Bureau straight to court. It has to right. go to the Commission first. It has to what? It no, has not, to I don't mean a court appeal. Can oh, it, can you appeal? Yes, you can, you can challenge it to the full commission. And if the commission decides we're not going to look it over, is, does the commission feel bound by that decision because they've declined to review it? <clears throat> well, if you challenge, if, you, if a party brings an the application Bureau has for decided. review to the commission, the commission has to, I mean, the commission should decide it. If somebody no, 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 wait, wait. I'm, I may be recalling things incorrectly, but that's why I want your clarification. Okay. If a party says we want to seek review from the Bureau's action and the commission says, seek review with the commission, the commission says we don't want to review it, so it stands, okay? Is the commission bound in the future by that disposition? Can I ask a clarifying question, Your Honor? Sure. When you said the commission doesn't want to decide it, does that mean the commission doesn't take action or the commission- The commission the says we are letting it stand. So they affirm the bureau. They yeah. issue an order saying- they, they we, we are not going <laughs> to change this disposition. I, I, my recollection is over the years that that happens and they simply say, we're not gonna, we're not gonna change this disposition. If the commission affirms, if the commission issues an order, Your Honor, that affirms the Bureau's grant of the bidding credit application. No, not the grant. That, that they just say we're not going to review it. Now, I, may be, I may be mistaken in my recollection of how this works. My understanding is the, the uh, agency, the FCC, can say we're not going to change this. We're not going to review this disposition. I'm not familiar with that process, Your Honor. Typically, typically what happens is if somebody, the commission only 
decides that it's not going to review something when it's brought to the commission's attention. Right. The commission affirms the bureau, but this process where the commission doesn't issue an order, but somehow affirmatively decides that it's not going to act on it, I'm not familiar with Okay, that. It, it, in your understanding, if the commission affirms an order without writing anything, are they bound by the bureau's decision? Your Honor, if the commission affirms the bureau decision, I believe it has to write a written order. And at that point, it would become commission precedent. So just to use an example, like um, in Airgate Wireless, which is discussed in the petitioner's brief. What happened was the Bureau granted the irrigated wireless application with conditions. It was challenged and the commission affirmed the Bureau's determination that the applicant was eligible for bidding credits. So at that point, not the procedures because the commission didn't affirm the procedures because it didn't say anything about the procedures. But if somebody wanted to come in and say, you granted the irrigate, you commission affirmed the Bureau's grant of the Airgate wireless bidding credit application, like the substantive grant, that becomes commission precedent. I hope I answered your question. Yes, you did. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Ready for their questions? No. No. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Blood. Thank you. Ms. Desson, we'll give you three minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. I, I want to talk briefly about what uh, SNR and North Star had notice of and what they didn't. Uh, what SNR and North Star had notice of uh, was that a put option itself under the fifth MO&O is not an issue. It's not a control concern. What they had notice of also under the fifth MO&O, paragraph 96, is what the commission emphasized over and over again in the 2015 decision, which is concerns are greatly increased when a single entity provides most of the capital and management services and is the beneficiary of investor protections. That's when the put option increases the concerns. That was the basis of the 2015 ruling. That's why that phrase that I just read you occurs at least five times in that ruling. The management services agreement was a huge feature of the 2015. If MO&O doesn't confine itself to having a, doesn't say a put order is only improper if combined with the management services order. It says just other terms of the agreement. Correct, but in terms of what we understood the problem to be, and you can see this at pages 36 to 37 of our opening brief and 25 to 26 of our reply, the management services agreement was the culprit. Uh, so we had noticed that that under the 2015 agreement was a problem, put option combined with the management services agreement. We had notice, as your honor pointed out, Judge Millett, that AWS Bidco and Advantage Spectrum had both been permitted to include standard put options uh, in their designated entity agreements with their investors. Because of course, this is a standard provision in a designated ent entity agreement. Those are the things we had notice of. Here's what we didn't have notice of. We didn't have notice to Judge Edwards's point that the commission would do something it never has done before, which is to conclude that even in the absence of the culprit management services agreement that was such a fundamental feature of the 2015 decision, even in the absence of the MSA, that a put option itself would be suggested to exert so much leverage that it couldn't do anything. Uh, we did not have notice um, under the 2020 analysis that the, the commission would latch- say, Did the opinion here say that the put option itself, I think you just said, was the problem here or did it say the put option does the decision say the put option in combination with other terms in the agreement that limit the ability, and I know you have disagreements with some of that, but that limit the ability, in the commission's view, that limit the ability to develop the business? I, I think that is part of the commission's pivot in 2020, yes. In, in 2015, it was put plus management services agreement equals control. Now it's put plus these other standard investor protections, which by the way, have never been found to be an issue. I cited you to footnote 232, of the 2015 decision where the commission says these protections are okay. Now the put option in combination with those standard investor protections is the problem. We could not have reasonably had notice of that because the put option is standard. And of course the Baker Creek investor protections are standard. We had no answer um, or no notice of the fact Judge Jackson to your questions, both to me and to Ms. Flood that even if the commission decided that it wouldn't have its staff meet with us as it's done 
every time before, even if the commission decided that there was control, that we would be punished. This isn't just a, a straight up classic a, a abuse of discretion review. This is a, a situation where these petitioners were not given sufficient notice that if they didn't if they actually followed form with the other designated entities in their same auction, they would nevertheless be found not to be in control of their designated but, entities but and just, would be punished. But but well, why do you can why do you say that they're punished in light of the very good point I thought that Judge Millett made earlier, which is regardless of all of the rest of this, at the beginning of this process, with respect to companies that were stood up within two weeks or so of the actual auction. It's a standard those, thing, yes. Those companies said, we are going to pledge to put up all of the money that would be necessary to buy these spectrum rights, right? I mean, there was no lack of clarity with regard to the obligation to pay for any licenses that they actually won in the auction. And so all of this notion of whether or not at the end of the day they got the discount seems to me that it has to be considered in light of the broader set of circumstances. Why is it punishment not to give them the discount that the FCC determines later based on all of the circumstances they're not eligible for? Why, why is it punishment under those circumstances to say, but you still have to pay the full fret, uh, price as you agreed to at the beginning. Your Honor, I think if, if it weren't a punishment, I, I don't think that the first SNR opinion would have come out the way it is. Of course it's a punishment. These entities, these small businesses- Our first decision to say this is a punishment? There's, are there words in, that say that? Yes, the, there's a default penalty uh, that's described in the regulations. And this, you know, in this case, it was to the tune of $500 million. But here's the other important point. What we didn't have notice Wait, of- Sorry, was that default penalty, was that for not qualifying as um, uh, very small businesses or was that for not carrying through on the commitment to pay the full bids? It was for not being in a position to pay the full bids because we did not get the benefit of the designated entity discount, which we had submitted for in the short form application. No, no, but you so had I think committed it's, to pay without that status. You had committed to pay either way. We had we had committed to pay as designated entity. Either way. You no, you had read. committed to pay either way before you made a bid. You could you can't commit in advance to pay only if I get my designated entity status. And we had sought designated entity you know, status along with that commitment. That initial, com but, I just, I'm trying to get a very clear answer to this question here. Yes. That initial commitment before you start bidding, that whatever the bid we make is, we will pay it, is what was made. There was not an asterisk that said, mm -hmm. if we get designated entity status. Your Honor, I think that's right, but let me add this as well. We submitted, even in the short form application, the agreements that showed uh, to the best of our knowledge and ability at the time that DISH didn't exercise control. So we made that commitment on the understanding to Judge Edwards's point that we could look at prior bureau practice and understand where those lines were. And that leads me to my last point, if you'll let me, which is these designated entities were left completely unprotected by the commission. Unlike every designated entity before, if the commission, to Judge Edwards is also earlier point, if the commission had actually permitted its staff to sit down with them, and by the way, every commission decision is drafted by the relevant bureau. So if the commission had permitted bureau staff to sit down with these entities and had discussions, all of these issues that we've been talking about for the last almost two hours could have been worked out. Uh, and if not worked out, then the parties would have walked away without designated entity status. But it was incumbent on the commission and on its staff to give us that opportunity. And because it didn't and led to a 2020 decision that was completely, un, completely foreign to us and unanticipated by us, either this is another terrible procedural footfall on the part of the commission, or it is a straight up administrative procedure violation because there was no way for these designated entities, these small businesses to know that they would be found still not to have control of their own businesses. My colleagues, no further questions? Thank I'm you done. very much. The case Thanks. is submitted. Thank you, Your Honor.
Excuse me just a second. Case number 21-7040, Mark Shefford, individually and on behalf of all others similarly situated at Al, at Balance, versus George Washington University and Board of Trustees of George Washington University, 20 CV 1417, and case number 21-7064, Mas Qureshi, individually and on behalf of all others similarly situated at Al, at Balance, versus American University. Mr. Kurowski for the appellant Mark Schaffer, Mr. Willie for the appellant Mass Qureshi, Mr. Schoenfeld for the appellee George Washington University, Mr. Schoenfeld for the appellee American University. Good morning, Mr. Kurowski. Good afternoon, is it afternoon? No, it's somewhere. We're still good, Your Honor. Uh, so good morning. Uh, may it please the court. My name is Daniel Kurowski, and I represent the appellants in the Schaefer versus George Washington University. Uh, and, and our clients were plaintiffs in the matter before the district court. And our, our clients paid George Washington University not simply to obtain a diploma and receive credits, but they paid amounts of money that were very large in order to have the opportunity to go to college. And so in accordance with the written materials that George Washington itself drafted throughout the history of our clients' interactions with George Washington and through the first half of the spring 2020 semester, your honors, they received just that. But during the second half of the spring 2020 semester, George Washington provided something that nobody bargained for. Students attended school away from campus, barred from facilities, resources, and facilities that accompany an on-campus education and from, for which they had always received throughout the history of their interactions with George Washington. So when George Washington converted to remote learning in the spring of 2020 in response to the coronavirus pandemic, um, it provided some refunds to, for some things like room and board, but it refused to provide pro rata refunds for things like tuition, certain mandatory fees. And as a result of that, we filed suit on behalf of our clients. Now, unfortunately, from our perspective, uh, the case was dismissed at the motion to dismiss stage. But consistent with the requirements set out in, in Rule 8 and the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure and when applying basic contract law and including contract law as it applies in the educational context within um, the, the law of the District of Columbia, we alleged each and every element necessary to plead an unjust enrichment. I think if, um, if there's a, I say this with hesitation given that there's some snow predicted in our weather, but if there were a, a big snowstorm um, that shut down sort of everything and power is out for say, a week of classes. Um, and so they aren't able to provide on-campus education uh, uh, classes or activities for that week um, till the power is restored and the ice is scraped off the road. Would that be a breach of contract or is it the, the length of time that's at issue here? Uh, um, I'd, I'd say at the start, one, that sort of short temporary scenario is, is not our case. And, and this is a situation where- I know that's not your case. Yeah. I'm asking the legal contract, your theory of the contract here. Sure. Um, and so take my hypothetical um, and everything's shut down for, you know, so Monday to Friday due to lack of electricity, ice covered roads, streets. Um, no classes, no activities can be provided. Um, is that a breach of contract or does the contract allow for short interruptions? Sure, I, I think in going back to the situation, that's a type of situation I, I think 
we would not say it's a breach of contract in this mm -hmm. instance because of the short duration of it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think part of the reason for that is when courts within DC are looking at contracts and interpreting contracts, um, one of the things that they're looking for is, is, you know, you're looking at the conduct of the parties and the situation and the milieu in which they've dealt is the kind of the, the way that one court is, has put it. And so when you're looking at the way that they've, the parties have dealt with each other in the past and the way that they, uh, and sort of what their reasonable expectations are, I think. Okay, so the contract that you're envisioning is to provide, I'm just going to call it as a shorthand, on-campus education. That's the classes, the activities, the um, um, opportunities to go into sort of buildings and specialized services and things. So on-campus education includes within it a recognition that there can be um, extreme circumstances can interrupt it at least for a short period of time. To a certain extent, I, I think the way that we've put it, and I, I think I, I'd better phrase it, Your Honor, is that, you know, although we, you know, understand that certain things happen and classes could be canceled or campus events might be rescheduled, um, you know, one thing would remain constant, and that is that, you know, the bargain was for an on-campus education and the core benefits that accompany it. And if there's sort of a temporary interruption in that, you know, I can't say we'd be before this court and bring a case on it. But I'm not asking whether you'd be bringing yeah. a lawsuit. I'm asking what your vision of the contract contractual obligation is. And, and, yeah, and it's, you know. It allows for those short interruptions. We wouldn't object to that, those short I'm interruptions. I'm not asking an objection. I'm asking your vision of the contract terms. Sure. Do you agree that, because we're dealing with, you know, we don't have a nice four corners contract here. So the different sources you're drawing from, you would agree that those do not obligate them to provide the full panoply of on-campus education in a, a new extreme circumstances um, for short periods of time. The problem is here, it was you know, dysfunctionally half, half a semester. I, I think in some, yes, Your Honor, I'd agree. And then if, um, do you dispute I mean, because I read your complaint and tell me if I'm wrong, that there's not really a dispute here that um, neither GW or AU just said, huh, professors would all like to go on vacation. We're just going to switch to online education, that it was all caused by the COVID pandemic. Is that, are we agreed on? That's not a fact that's in dispute, that the, the, tr the transition to online or remote learning was caused by the pandemic. We have alleged in our complaint that the transition occurred because of the pandemic. And do you, you don't dispute that in fact, at least as of um, uh, March 24th, it would have been illegal for GW or the American University to operate on campus, provide on campus lessons or activities because all non-essential businesses had been shut down by order of the mayor. Um, I, I don't think that that was as deep clearly pled in the case. So I can't- I'm, necessarily... to, I'm, I'm asking the, I don't know what part wasn't pled. You said COVID caused the shutdown. Yeah, and in terms take of- take judicial the... notice of the mayor of Mayor Bowser's lockdown order. Sure, and I, I think the, my, my point was toward this way that whether it was illegal or not, and I don't think that we, you know, flush that out before the district court. But you don't need to. Say, you don't need to. I, do you at least concede that it was infeasible, that they could not, under the circumstances, actually provide in-person instruction during this time? I think that, um, you know, we would agree that, but I think that has important consequences, Your Honor. And, and what that involves is issues of impossibility and when well, we're not necessarily, at, and I don't want to jump into maybe Judge Millette is going there. That is. <laughs> yeah, so not necessarily. I think I think that may actually have an implication for the kind of promise that you need to have had the university to make in order to state a claim for breach in this case, right? I mean, it seems to me that if you concede that it was infeasible for the university to actually provide in-person instruction then in order to state a claim for breach, you needed the university to promise 
to provide in-person instruction no matter what, right? It had to be an unconditional guarantee of in-person instruction because if their promise was we will provide in-person instruction as long as it's feasible, or we will do our best to provide in-person instruction or you know, some conditional uh, promise like that, then you lose because we know it wasn't feasible. We know they did their best. Um, so the only thing that gets you to actual breach in this case is if the university said, we guarantee you, not necessarily explicitly, they could have said it implicitly, but it had to be a guarantee of in-person instruction. And so I'd like to know whether you actually allege that they essentially made a money back guarantee in this way. And if you do allege that, is it plausible that a university would make that kind of guarantee to their students, especially when they have reserved the right to change programs, et cetera, et cetera? Sure, Your Honor. And breaking that apart, I think there's some parts of that I would agree with you on and some parts I think I disagree with you on. Okay. Um, I think starting, you know, from the first instance, um, you know, did George Washington have to say, um, we agree no matter what or no matter the circumstances to provide in-person education? Um, GW didn't say that one way or the other. No, wait, I'm not, let me just be clear. I'm not saying that they had to make an express statement. I'm not saying that they had to actually say it. I agree that they can promise implicitly. But the question is, what was the promise? What did they actually promise to do? So they could have implicitly, I suppose, promised money back guarantee kind of certainty that you would be able to go to class, right? Fine. Um, but where is that in terms of the allegations or the facts in this case? Gotcha, gotcha. I, I think that there's a number of principles under DC law that we use in order to, to assert a plausible claim for breach of contract in this case. And so when courts are construing contracts involving universities and um, students, you know, it's not a clean document. There's no, of course, document titled contract. So we're looking at things like communications, but not just communications, Your Honor. We're also looking at the usual practices and reasonable expectations. And so there, there's a whole line of case law in, uh, in DC that recognizes that contracts are to be read by reference to the norms of conduct and the expectations founded upon them. But and don't so we have the Bash case that says expectations are not enough? to establish a binding promise? I thought we had that line of authority too. Well, I, I think the Bash case is, is helpful in a general regard, but you know, I think it's certainly not helpful to an addition for one important reason. And that is Bash uh, was a summary judgment decision. And so there's an opportunity for fact finding um, that occurs as a part of that and, and discovery happened. Right, and but can you just certainly now, not what can you narrow in very kind of focused on what it is that you're alleging the university promised to your students? And am I right or wrong that as a matter of law, under these particular circumstances, that promise had to be unconditional in terms of the university saying, essentially, not saying, but acting as if, you have to be able to have the in-person experience no matter what. The promise did not have to be unconditional. Why because not? George Washington um, you know, could have drafted a disclaimer or a reservation of right that was so clear and unambiguous that it could provide itself an out. And I think the problem gets- No, an out from what though, right? The, you're asking us to infer an implied promise. So I'm just trying to figure out whether the pro whether it makes any sense to infer that they intended to make the kind of promise that would bind them to providing in-person instruction no matter what. And I think you have to have that because if they were to, you know, it, it, I could agree with you that there was some promise here and that that promise might even encompass 
in-person instruction, that they promised that you would have an in-person experience. The question is, was that promise a conditional one, right? That you would have an in-person experience so long as we're able to provide it, as long as it's feasible for us to do so. Why, why, why isn't that the sort of outer bounds of the plausible promise that the university makes to its students about in-person? Because the university never made such a statement limiting when or it would or would not provide in-person education. And, and so that's why we're falling back on people. I, I, what I want to, um, I mean, maybe they couldn't just say, oh, we don't think it's feasible. We just had to pay some huge amount of our endowment to settle some litigation or something. So that's, it's not just that it's not feasible, but is it not an inherent component of every contract um, that compliance in violation of law is not required? Courts can't enforce a contract if its terms, if its operation, even if initially it was a valid contract, something happened and now it would be unlawful for one party to comply. Does that have to be written or is that just not inherent? Because courts, there's plenty of case law that courts will not enforce contractual obligations that themselves are contrary to law. Isn't that, that's gotta be part of this contract, isn't it? I think as a matter of general fundamental principles, you're right, Your Honor. And I don't want to ask about general so, fundamental principles. I want to ask, isn't that inherently a part of whatever contract you had here, that compliance that requires um, uh, illegal conduct? For example, if GW had said, we're going to keep having classes, and if you do not show up, or if you show up, we're in a mask, we'll kick you out. And if you don't show up, we're going to mark you absent and five absences lead to a failing grade. So if the school kept going and forced students to come or fail, surely students could say, you can't enforce that. That's a breach of contract, but you can't force us to engage in unlawful conduct and violation of the district order and an imperil of our own health. Couldn't they? Could the students bring such a claim in such a situation? I, I don't know if in that situation they could, Your Honor, because the way really? that, it, 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 well, and, and I'm trying to break it apart a little bit here, and okay. that might be where the disconnect is. Um, when, when we're looking at contract in, in the educational context and, you know, an implied contract situation, you're looking at historically how have the people dealt with each other, and the way that you've presented it, Your Honor, involves like novel fact issues that, that aren't here, but I, I'd like to, you know, say backing up I'm, I'm, I'm just presenting from the flip side my exact point about can one party compel circumstances of change. I'm not talking about a contract that's illegal of an issue, right? Circumstances change. And so if it's unlawful for the student to do their part or if it's unlawful for the university to do its part, um, I think in that then that's in every contract, isn't it? I would say yes, to a certain extent, Your Honor, it, it implied if anything under the law. But I think what the important thing and distinction to keep in mind here is that um, what what in such a situation that doesn't mean people are left without any remedies. And so, but there's no breach. There's no breach. Judge Millett's point is that there's no breach in that case. If that's in every contract, then setting it up the way that I would think about it, that's a condition that the, the, the party is saying, I will offer you in-person classes so long it is not unlawful to do so. So right. that if that's the contract in this situation, it would have been unlawful, so there's no breach, right? Well, we disagree that, that there is no breach. I think the way that your honors have been phrasing it involves a lot of different fact issues and questions above and beyond the question of whether we have pled a breach. And the way that we've- I'm not sure this isn't anything that's not apparent from the face of your complaint and you know, judicial notice of the mayor's lockdown order. But, but I think the point is that when a contract that's a perfectly lawful contract becomes due to circumstances beyond anyone's control, legally unenforceable by a court, right? A court could assume, assume a, a court couldn't say, you breached the contract by not taking these illegal actions. And I, I'd that's, like to. It's just a launch pad into unjust enrichment, isn't it? 
I, I, correct. If, if a contract remedy would That's not a different be available, question. If we can't, just, enforcement of the contract is no longer something a court can do. That doesn't mean that you, you know you may win or lose, but it doesn't mean that you wouldn't get the opportunity to say there was never an agreement that the students would bear the full cost of such con that you know only one party would bear the full cost of such a development. I mean that's a whole other issue. I'm sorry, I Jeffrey, ask a couple of questions. I I saw your complaint. The background for me, and you can tell me if I'm misreading it, the background for me, the DC law is pretty clear uh, over a long period of time that the relationship between the university and a student is contractual in nature. So we know that there is a contractual commitment coming from the university. And I thought what your your claim was that the university reading all of the relevant materials and especially using the implied in fact test, what you're saying is that the university promised that as a general practice, we offer live education on campus as a general practice. And that is our promise to you. And so there are any of number of examples that I could give, there was one in the district court in Delaware I asked, Council, for example, could the university announce, oh, you know, we're running out of money. Uh, you have to learn on your own now. Is that permissible? And no one seen, no one on either side was confused that that breached the implied promise made by the university, which was, as a general practice, we're having live education and campus arrangement. I, I understood the, some of the claims that my colleagues are, are raising to be matters that could be raised in a motion to dismiss case as defenses raised by the universities. That is, it was impossible, it was unlawful, or whatever, and we could not have lived up to that implied uh, contract. And you might lose on that pretty readily. And, and, and uh, I think it's easy to see the pandemic being raised as a defense to your implied contract claim. And then the last piece, again, I just want to make sure I'm understanding your thinking. The last piece of what I understood was that you were saying, in any event, it doesn't matter because we surely have an unjust enrichment claim uh, and the possibility, the possibility of restitution here. If the universities, both of these universities, distinguish between live versus online, and they charge differently. They've already valued them differently. Uh, they charge substantially more for the regular live education and campus arrangements. And in one of them, they say, but you can be admitted and go online and get a degree, but you're not gonna get what those who are paying the bigger money for. So what you were saying is, in your view, you think there is restitution that's due, but once again, we certainly can't decide that on a motion to dismiss. And as I, so as I understand your argument, uh, they may win fairly quickly on your implied contract claim. And as I read your claim, it's there is a promise that our general practice is live and you still may lose it because the pandemic knocks it out. But that is a matter that should not be decided on a motion to dismiss because of there, there are terms on the implied terms to be filled out and we haven't filled them out yet. Am I am I understanding you correctly? I think on a whole, Your Honor, I think that's a fair, accurate and summary. And the, uh, the only sort of quibble I, I'd say is in terms of the issues of illegality or whether the pandemic prevented um, the contract from being executed. I think there's two points on that. One, that involves fact questions, not appropriate for resolution on a motion. That's decide. what I just said. Okay, that, then we're on the same page. Hang on, there's DC. Don't have to, I'm sorry. There all is I, I'm, I'm, let me just finish. All I said was, and I don't know what the answer to it is. All I said was that my understanding of your claim is it's a motion to dismiss. And uh, at least in the cases in which I've, I've, I've read, that seems the correct answer. That is, you don't decide this on a motion to dismiss. There may be defenses that the university can raise, and they may be able to win them quickly. But in any event, you can't do it on a motion to dismiss. And the last piece of my understanding your argument is 
you can plead alternatively under federal rules. And there's an argument in here in these two cases uh, with some, one of the district judges has suggested you can't plead in the alternative. And I think you're saying, and I don't understand how you can't, you certainly can plead in the alternative, the, con the express contract, the implied contract, and the unjust enrich enrichment. If I got your position correct? That is correct, Your Honor. I just wanted to follow up. Go ahead. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Judge Millet. Um, the DC Circuit law that says um, explicitly holds that an affirmative defense may be raised by pre answer motion under Rule 12, that is our 12B6 stage, uh, when the facts that give rise to the defense are clear from the face of the complaint. And it's clear from the face of the complaint, and you've agreed here that the reason, the one and only reason that these two universities halted the provision of on-campus education to which you claim contractual entitlement was a pandemic, a public health emergency, which in very short order became subject to a lockdown order enforceable by civil and criminal, criminal penalties in the District of Columbia none of which is disputed, all of which is on the face of your complaint, or we can take judicial notice of the lockdown order that ensued from the pandemic causation that you have acknowledged. Um, and so we don't really have to wait for a, a, a later summary judgment in this very unusual circumstance. I mean, that's what struck me here is no one disputes what happened happened, why this happened, and no one seems to dispute that had there not been a pandemic, y'all would have stayed on campus for the rest of the semester. Um, and I don't hear any dispute, but please tell me if this is one of the facts you think you need to look into, um, that it would have been contrary to the directions of public health officials, to locally, <laughs> nationally, and internationally, to continue holding classes. And it would have been once the lockdown order was issued in violation of district law to have held classes. So this is an unusual type of contract claim. And it's pretty settled as well on this motion to dismiss that a court, even if it's a perfectly valid contract, a court can't enforce terms that become contrary to law. So I don't, I don't understand why, please explain to me more, more what facts you think need to get developed on this narrow question of whether a court could hold that uh, the obligation to provide on-campus education continued at a minimum after the lockdown order was issued. What facts need to be developed that would al have allowed GW or AU to continue providing on-campus education after the lockdown order? Sure, I think one, um, the, the facts would include whether and to what extent um, and the breadth of which the uh, applicable orders that were used. That's not a fact. That's reading the law. I mean, we can, we can pull it up. I pulled it up. <laughs> you can pull it up. You're what are you up. saying? Whether the classes were mass gatherings that were prohibited? I mean, is that the way you're cutting it? Because the it law, you may be right. The law didn't say, I, I don't know this. The law didn't say universities can have classes, as I recall. I thought the law said, focus more on math gathering. Is that, is that what you're talking, I'm asking, is that what you're talking about? It, it is, Your Honor. So for example, could- That's not the lockdown order. The lockdown order allowed public and private universities to remain open solely for the purpose of facilitating distance learning and distance operations, modifying facilities, um, to address the public health issues. And then, you know, there was transition time on university housing. That's not on-campus education. On-campus education was forbidden by the lockdown order. And, and the reason why I think that's a- so That's not a fact question, that's you, a law question. Sure, Your Honor. And I, I think the where I'm struggling with responding to Your Honor in the way that, that you phrased it is because, you know, I'm stepping back to the pr concept where, you know, principles and, and contracts are to be read in light of the conditions and circumstances existing at the time that they were entered into. And yes. the pandemic yes. and everything is a subsequent situation. 
And so when you have something that comes up later. No, counsel, no, Judge Millett right and Judge Jackson are right that if the law, and I just don't remember the details now, we we're all so sick of this that we <laughs> don't even can remember anything. If the law really effectively said classes cannot happen, they have to be closed down. Uh, and you use remote learning. I mean, however, I'm, do, I'm doing it in a very loose way. But if that's what the law said, and everyone knows that, we're not going to take that past the motion to dismiss if you're in that situation and we all know, and you're not claiming the law is impermissible. Why would we take that past? The, the restitution and unjust dismiss, and, uh, I'm sorry, unjust uh, in Richmond. any event, <laughs> that's a different issue. I don't know how that can possibly survive. Uh, Mr. Schaefer, can I, just, can I just sort of summarize this in a different, I mean, not Mr., excuse me, Mr. Schaefer, Mr. Karofsky. Can I summarize this in a little different way, what I hear is going on here? And it's sort of what I alluded to, to begin with. I actually don't see this as accelerating the impossibility defense because a defense only occurs and is only necessary if we believe that there was a breach, right? If, if, if the defendant were to say, yes, we breached the contract, we had promised X, we did not give X, that is a breach of contract, but here's our defense, impossibility, right? What I thought this case was about was whether and to what extent the university made a promise to continue education in person under all circumstances. And the reason why you had to have that in my view is because you have conceded that it was infeasible, unlawful or whatever for the university to continue. So the only way you have a breach, the only way you're able to say they did something that we now are entitled to get a remedy for, right? they broke their promise is if they had promised you that they would go forward regardless, right? It, initially, when the promise was made, we are giving you a money back guarantee that you will get in-person instruction under all circumstances. And so then you come and say, yeah, we know that you couldn't give it, but you promised us that under all circumstances, we'd be entitled to it, so you've breached. And my, my worry, is that in this situation that we have right here, we don't have any written language from the university. You're correct about that. So we're all trying to figure out what the university implicitly promised. And where I get hung up is trying to find an implicit promise of the university that they would go forward under all circumstances. I don't see that in the materials. I don't see the circumstances as, as, as even plausibly giving rise to that, especially when they had language in their uh, uh, various materials that gave them the right to make changes. The other thing that I think I would like for you to speak to perhaps, and I know your, your other counsel should have an opportunity, so maybe you wanna pitch this to him, um, is this notion of in-person versus uh, online learning and the difference in the value, I don't really know whether that hurts you or helps you. And let me tell you why I think that's the case, because we're also trying to figure out what is the core of the product that is being offered by a university. And one could conceive of that core as instruction classes toward credits that you can put to get a degree at the university or instruction for credit toward a degree. That happens whether it's online or in person. That seems to me like the core and the fact that the university could offer different products, one that's in person versus one that's online, to me indicates that the in-person nature of it is actually not the core of it that that's kind of ancillary. You pay more for that if you want it in that format, but the real thing is just getting classes for credit that you can put toward a degree. And that you've gotten that, whether you did it, you know, during a pandemic time, uh, online or not, and therefore the university has not actually breached the core of what it is that it promised to its students. 
So I don't know if you want to react to that or you want to, if, if, you know, you want to wait and let Mr. Wiley do it. Sure. I, I'll offer my thoughts, Your Honor. And then, you know, certainly if you want to ask questions of, of Mr. Wiley, I, I, you know, I don't know how you want to split up our time across the people. Um, and I understand, you know, we're certainly past the time. You know, I, I'd say that, you know, one, um, in terms of the, co the points Your, Honor's ma Your Honor made about the core of the deal, the core of the deal that you would describe sounds to me to be different than the core of the deal that we've described. And right. the core of the deal that we've described is in, in, in emphasized is the importance of the in-person education. And so when we're stepping back to apply- I, I mean, I want to, because there is a difference in understanding, I want to make sure it's clear in my head what your position is, not who's right what your position, my understanding was you were saying nothing more than, and indeed the materials you'll point to don't say anything more than this applied deal that as a general practice will give live on-campus education. Nothing more, nothing about no matter what. There was no, you're not claiming there was a no matter what promise. Is that right? Uh, that, that's correct, Your Honor. And I'll add that, you know, that no matter what issue, I, I disagree with that's a point George Washington has made in their brief that, you know, there's no promise of no matter what. Th that matters because George Washington, you know, we're looking at the bulletin. It could have drafted the terms differently. It could have expressly reserved the school. No, no, I'm just asking. I want to just confirm because there is a difference here. I just want to confirm my understanding. Your complaint is not that they breached the contract because we think they made a promise of on campus live no matter what. My understanding was you were saying nothing more than their promise is that as a general practice, it would be live and uh, uh, on campus. Is that right? That's right. They promised in-person instruction, Your Honor. As a general, as a general pra practice. As a general practice. As a general practice and as it applies here. No, so, how, so why was there a breach? If the promise was there, we're, we will give you in-person instruction as a general practice, not as a no matter what, as a general practice, why under these circumstances where you concede that they couldn't do it under these circumstances, it was infeasible, it was unlawful, why is there a breach? Why is that a breach of the promise to not give it under these circumstances? Because this was not a general ordinary situation, this was the unusual situation. Yeah, so they didn't I, I break their it, promise, right? They didn't sure. break their promise. Uh, well, I, I think in this instance, it would kind of have to be tie in with the fact that there was no refund provided. So, for example, um, it, they, it, the, in addition to closing the campus, for example, um, one of the issue, things that are not at issue is room and board. So students were sent home and those students that received room and board that were went off campus um, received refunds for for their but, but those are, those are based on different promises right there are other promises that relate to room and board you pay this extra money and you get to stay in the dorm right you pay this extra money and you get a certain number of meals those are are other promises that required because those are the core of those promises a refund because they paid the extra money and they couldn't stay in the dorm so fine with respect to tuition right? So if Judge Edwards is correct, and if your complaint is read to be the promise that you'll have in-person education classes as a general matter, not no matter what, but as a general matter, why is there a breach in this case? Because George Washington kept the entirety of the money, even though it delivered a different product. Okay, so I think what you're saying is there were two promises here. Um, the default rule is, first one is on-campus education, that's a default rule, and we don't have to decide on what terms they could change it, because in this case, it was driven by external circumstances, the, the law wouldn't have allowed them to do it, so that what, whatever might or might not fall in the uh, general rule or presumption of when they could change that provision of on-campus education, this one has to be right, that they could stop it. Um, but you're saying there's a second promise that you're implying, right or wrong, um, but your, your complaint is alleging is that if all the students are getting is online classes, then all they should be paying is your online tuition. And so that there was, there was a promise that if, if you've turned us into online students and no longer on-campus students, at least for 
a significant period of time, we'll give you a snow day or two. Um, then at that point, you can't treat us financially, you wouldn't treat us financially like um, still on campus students. So there's two promises. Is, is that, am I, am I saying it right? I, I think breaking it apart, Your Honor, that, that, that sounds right. And I think both of them kind of come down to the, the notion that, you know, our, our clients didn't receive the benefit of their bargain. But, know, I, but, I, but I have to say, Mr. Karaski, they, they reduced to the same thing. I don't see two promises. The second promise is just a money back guarantee that, if, that you're gonna be on campus, right? I mean, you, you, you can't hold both of those in the same uh, set of circumstances. What Judge Millett has said effectively, I think, with respect to the second promise is, unless you're on campus, you get your money back. That that's the promise. And, and, and I just wanna know, is that what you are alleging that they said? And is it plausible that the university would have made that promise to its students, knowing that ice storms happen, knowing that plant programs have to change? Is it plausible to believe that the university would have given the students a money back guarantee concerning on-campus experience? I think that is really what you have to establish. And Your Honor, that's where I, I disagree. I think those are things that GW could have written down and concluded that they said, you know, and that they said, you know, no, no money back if we have to cancel or go to classes online. They could have said that, but they didn't. And so when we're done with what we're left with is application of general contract principles and con nothing in the lockdown order. Things. Nothing in the lockdown order forbid it. Um from, there's nothing unlawful about, if you're right, about them reimbursing some tuition, right? That doesn't stop them from that aspect. Correct. And, and the lockdown order certainly doesn't eliminate our, um, you know, opportunities to seek a, a remedy or limit students' remedies, whether expressly or impliedly. It, it... That's your unjust enrichment argument. If the law, if the law can't descended and said this contract can't be enforced um, anymore, then you would go to unjust enrichment and, and, and argue now argue about whether there was this agreement to partial money money back or partial money back guarantee. Um, that's a whole other argument, but that would be done under the guise of unjust enrichment because courts can't enforce, can't say there was a legal obligation to keep providing on-campus education in these circumstances. That is where unjust enrichment would come in to, to fill the void and um, you know, certainly in, in our case, we weren't able to not fill in the void, um, would come in to provide a remedy. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, I think that that's generally correct, Your Honor. Um, unless you have any additional questions specific to me, uh, I'd certainly. My colleagues have any more questions for Mr. Karowski? Give Mr. Will, Wiley, Willie a time to okay. uh, address the issues as well. Is it, is, is it Mr. Willie or Wiley? I'll let him answer. You don't have to answer that. <laughs> <for> that. <laughs> Good, good morning, Your Honors. It's Roy Willie, and I represent the Qureshi plaintiffs against uh, American University. I also represent uh, the Montesano plaintiffs and the case against Catholic University, which survived the motion to dismiss in this circuit. And what I would say is this. Let me start with Judge Jackson's um, it, it question about breach, because I do think that that cuts to the heart of the matter. And I think it's important to note that an American contract jurisprudence, we do not disclaim in the affirmative. That is to say that a contract does not need to say that I will perform it on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. In other words, if it's not disclaimed in the negative, if that contract does not say that it is not in effect on Sundays, then it is always in effect. And I am always expected to perform under that contract. And so Except contracts- Unless the law- requires otherwise. Right, Judge Millett, and that's where I'm going to next. So the con- Mr. the con Before you go, <laughs> before Sorry. you go, is it your position, I take from what you've just said, that a party or a group, two parties cannot agree to a conditional contract? They cannot make promises that are conditional? Two in parties- any way? Two parties can agree to a conditional contract. And I think the important part of that here is the fact that one of those parties, American University, has been in existence and operated a campus during pandemics. American University operated a campus during the Spanish influenza pandemic, during the polio pandemic, 
during the H1N1 pandemic and right. others and had the ability. Yeah. So given and, that, is it your, your, your argument then is that it is plausible for us to conclude that when American made this promise, it intended it to be unconditional, meaning it was saying, you come to campus, you come on uh, in person under all circumstances. See, previously, even in prior pandemics, we were able to operate. So our promise to you is you guaranteed in person. That's how you read the circumstances here. Yes, and at worst, it's a factual question as to what the course of dealing and reasonable expectations of the students were under the circumstance. And that's where we get into Judge Millett's question about the snow days. We know that in Washington, D.C. or in Boston, where I went to college, <laughs> we have snow days regularly. Washington, D.C. deals with snow days quite differently. Uh, uh, American University deals with snow days quite differently than Harvard deals with snow days, for example. And the course of dealing between the parties and the reasonable expectations between the parties are what come into play in that circumstance. But here we actually have historical precedent where American University had the ability and they was could there have contracted. Order? There are school was there a lockdown order with the 1919 pandemic? Uh, that, that is not uh, in the record, uh, but what I will tell you is, is this, that this is not an enforcement action. And so the lockdown order is almost immaterial as to the motion to dismiss stage because we are not asking for specific performance of the contract. And if you read the papers- uh, in, No, in but you're saying you're gonna, you, you don't want specific performance, but you want damages because from March 24th on, right. they didn't, you want damages they breached the contract by not continuing to provide on-campus education. Right, and preci precisely they, because- the loss, But a court could not issue an order that said, how could a court issue an order that says, under this contract, they were obligated to continue providing on-campus education, notwithstanding the lockdown order? Because I know this is not specific performance, the time has long since run. But a court would to find a breach on your theory, we would have to say it, it breached the contract not to provide on campus education after the lockdown order. It 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 did breach the contract. I don't think that there's any okay. question I, about that in the can difference. Give me an example here. of a court that has held and has said in terms it is a breach of contract not to undertake promised actions that the government has declared unlawful. The, the, the distinction in, I think, what we are getting at in respect to this contract and other contracts, this contract was prepaid. So in other words, the students had already performed. This is not a contract where there is ongoing course of performance from both parties. The students had already performed in terms of paying the that tuition like and fees. an issue of, for unjust enrichment. I wanna focus solely on breach of contract. Okay, With, and you said they had a contractual obligation given what happened during the Spanish pandemic, your allegations about that here, um, that they had a contractual obligation to continue providing on-campus education. You just said yes to that question. Okay. How can right. you have, tell me what your best case is that you can have a contractual obligation to provide, to undertake contact that is contrary to law. It might have been lawful beforehand, but now it is contrary to law. What is your best case for a court saying we can hold that they still had that contractual obligation? Well, I think you have to look at the, the, the facts here in terms of what we're dealing with in an educational contract, which I guess is- I'm asking you for a case, case law that says- There, there is no educational contract-based case that looks at the factual predicate of reasonable expectations. You don't need an education case for me. If you can show me any case for any contract where a court has said, we, it's undisputed that performance, continued performance would be unlawful. Nonetheless, you breached the contract by not doing so. Right, and I don't know that there is a case and an express contract scenario, which of course is what most contract cases that come to the court are, there is no factual analysis necessary for that. 
right. mirror help. They have actually made the promise at issue. This is my right. point, which is slightly different than Judge Millett's, which is she says a contractual obligation is the key and whether or not it could still be performed in this way, even though it was unlawful. I say, is there even a contractual obligation in this situation? Because notwithstanding the university's prior activity and whatnot, we have to determine what the, in, what the university intended to promise its students, right? Uh, Implicitly. No. What so, is, no, I'm wrong about no, that. Isn't no. the intent of the parties with respect to the promise what governs in a contract situation? No, with, with with respect to the reasonable expectation of the parties, it is what the, the university would have reasonably expected uh, the students to give it. And that's on page 12 of our brief. That's the Giles v. Howard University case. And that is exactly the point. You've honed in on exactly the point, which is this. What expectation would the students have with respect to that contract if it were to be breached? And we can look in our case. No, Mr. Par- Wiley, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm getting confused. I'm talking, I understood that the university had to make a promise to the students and that you were trying to enforce that promise in the context of this breach of contract right. action. Am I right, right about right. that? All right. Correct. So the question is, when we don't have language, when we don't have an actual written contract that says, I promise to give you in-person instruction. And we're trying to infer, right, whether there was an implicit promise to that degree. My question is, what exactly is the university promising? And I say, we have to think about the university's intent. What would a university, what did this university intend to promise with respect to this issue? Am I wrong about that? I, I disagree slightly with that. And let me read you the case site, which is on page 12 of our, of our initial brief. And it says this, it's a quote from the Giles v. Howard University case. The standard is that of reasonable expectation. What meaning the party making the manifestation, the university should reasonably expect the other party to give it. Not what manifestation the university intended the other party to give it, but what manifestation the I'm university not about the students? I'm just talking about the promise that the university is making to the students. I agree. Trying to enforce. Okay, so setting aside whatever the students are or what they give the university in terms of the money, I just want to know what your view is of how we're supposed to understand the promise that the university was making to its students concerning their experiences on campus. As it is pled in our consolidated complaint, it is a promise to provide with respect to tuition, and I would note that the tuition and fees claims are separate, but with respect to tuition, an in-person, on-campus educational experience, period. The university has the ability to come back and challenge that, and if they do, then we get into the factual question of what should the university have reasonably expected the students to believe they were getting. And let me give you a fact. Wait, wait, before you leave, before you leave to the, I'm I'm very interested in this point. You say a promise to provide in-person experience, period. The period matters to me because what I'm trying to understand is whether really, even if we saw that in writing in a contract, the university meant promise to provide in, person experiences so long as the law allowed it, Mm. so long as it was infeasible, so long as, right? Now, maybe they didn't, maybe your argument is no, they meant in-person period, meaning under all circumstances, right? right? Is that what your argument is? Under all circumstances, you get this experience. That is what that is what we have pled. And let and let me tell you why that matters. Just one, and I'm not okay. leaving. I'm telling yeah. you why that matters. Okay. Why that matters is because it is what the students expected to be provided for what they had already paid. And I'll give you a factual example. Oh. So in the Amer- in the American University case on p- paragraphs 55 and 56 of our complaint, we specifically plead, uh, which is a fact in the case that American University provided students a 10% discount on tuition and and didn't charge some of the fees for the summer and fall of 2020 where the students were online. So now we have a factual question of 
when the university did that after, did the students reasonably expect that if the university would have gone online in that spring 2020 semester, that they would have received some of the money back? Because All right, so now that, let me ask you, why, why is it our task then to evaluate the plausibility of a promise in that way? In other words, is the student's expectation reasonable when the materials themselves say things like, we reserve the right to change the formatting of our programming, right? So fine, maybe the students expected that, but we understand from DC law that an expectation is not enough. And we have some indicia in this record in the materials that you point us to, that the university reserved its right to make changes, to make changes. So even if the students heard that promise and expected it to be, we get it under all circumstances, how plausible is that, that, that the university was actually making that promise? Well, I think at the outset, we're not really looking at plausibility. We're weighing facts when we get to that point. And Judge Friedrich in the Montesano v. Catholic opinion laid it out this way. She said, the reservation of rights clearly permit the universities to make some changes to course programming and educational services, yet certain assumptions of the broader implied contract between the universities and their students are so fundamental that the reservation of rights cannot reasonably be interpreted to waive them. That quote was also in Judge Bebus's decision. Yes, he was I sitting by the, as- I, I yeah, But it. neither Be Bebus nor Frederick are, are construing the plaintiff's claim to be the university promised on, I mean, uh, on campus education, no matter what. You but agreed with my colleague that that's what your claim is. That seems, that makes no sense to me. That's what your claim is? The university has promised on campus live, no matter what, that's the promise? That doesn't fit custom and practice. Well, let, let, that, that's exactly right, Judge Edwards. And perhaps I was not as uh, specific as I should have been in explaining it. That is what is pled in this case. But that is the exactly the same reason that I would not bring a case, for example, for a snow day. Because the custom and practice, it's a factual question of what is the custom and practice. Right. But the factual question as to snow days would most definitively be resolved in favor of the university. No, but my point is your starting point makes no sense to me. Your starting point is that the university impliedly promised that we will be on campus live no matter what? Until there is factual development the, the, within the materials set of And the two judges, at least Beavis, certainly doesn't view it that way. Uh, I don't think Friedrich does either, but uh, that doesn't make any sense. That makes it a little bit harder for us to think about but I think they're not, the claim can be nothing more than the university is promised as a general practice pursuant to custom and practice, we will have online and I'm not sorry, not online. We will have a, a, a live and on campus education. That's what we are promising. And for example, it's just like Bebus raised the hypothetical for his parties. He said, does anyone doubt if the university announced tomorrow we're losing money. We're going to have no more on campus and no more live. Is that a breach of the contract? Everyone agreed. It's a breach. Right. Because it's, inc it's inconsistent with custom and practice. It's not inconsistent with an express promise. Right. Okay. Right. And, that, and that's where we depart from the factual analysis versus what is pled. What I am telling you is what is pled in our complaint is that this promise was made. When you start analyzing what the promise, fact, which promise, which promise, which promise, that the, 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 uni that what? the university, the university has promised in person on campus educational services and it's a pertinent benefit to its students. The university may come in and say, well, that wasn't a reasonable expectation of the students because of X, Y and Z. But that is a factual question. Right. So you're so not right. you're you're excluding the no matter what now. You're not saying it's no matter what. You're well, saying we don't we don't disclaim in the affirmative. So if we make a promise okay. in American jurisprudence, it okay. is in contractual law, it is no matter what, unless we have a disclaimer to say it's not. And let me just tell, let me just add this briefly, and then I know Judge Jackson might have a question. There are other universities. I have about 50 or 60 of these cases nationwide. There are other universities that have disclaimers in their handbooks that specifically deal with pandemics, right. that have force majeure language, which could have been included. Parties have a right to contract and the university 
Of course, I mean, it's not I an adhesion have a contract. Right. Do you disagree with Mr. Karowski that implicit, at least implicit in every contract is a limitation on performance that would be illegal? Yes, there is a limitation on performance that would be illegal. But, to well, well, on specific performance, you cannot contract to, to conduct a specific performance. No, I, I, didn't, specific I did not add that. I'm just saying that courts cannot enforce a contractual term. It's built into every contract that is unlawful for that party to perform. The contract says, let's make be ridiculous. The contract says the university can cut off the head of a student if they do poorly in a course. Do you think that's, that we just, and, and that's your basis for your claim? No, of course, you of course. No, of course you, you put that in your complaint, but there's a clear contract provision. Right. And no. the reason we're not going to, we're not going to give you a, the time of day is because it's an impermissible, right? I agree. And, and I agree with that. I agree with that as a contract principle, but here, here is the difference that I'm trying to draw and, and perhaps I'm not being clear. The students had already agreed to pay X amount for one thing and in fact had paid. Right. So if I call into the grocer and I say, here's my credit card and they immediately charge me for peaches, bananas, whatever, and they know that I normally pick up a week later, but they got my money. And now for very good lawful reasons, there are no peaches and bananas. What? I get the money back. You get your money back. Right. Is that, and so how are we analyzing that under your notion of breach of contract? They, you, you had an implicit contract. Even though I play, paid in advance, is that what, what do you say? I want to hear what you're saying. I know what you, I mean. you, in, in that instance, you had an implied sales contract for peaches right? and bananas, it can, which it you prepaid cannot for. be performed. It cannot be, and no one's doubting. Correct. And as a result, it was breached. And so they owe you the money back under the contract. And that's, at the very least, that's at the a very point. That's just, I mean, yeah. that it's the, um, when a contract that was perfectly lawful when entered into becomes, due to circumstances beyond either party's control, unlawful to continue performance, then you can have an unjust enrichment claim. That's when I make know. my bananas and peaches are now unlawful to sell after I paid. There's been a recall because of their infestation. There's been a recall. They cannot be sold because they're and dirty. E. They are now on, they were lawful when I paid and I paid for them. Mm -hmm. And now I come in. How do I analyze it? Under well, your well, well, can you, it, it, can you survive damages. a motion to dismiss? Yes. Let, let me add, let me add one more element to really? that. So no, no, middle, take my hypothetical. There, okay. Don't change my hypothetical. There, there, there's a middleman involved. And no, no, no. Bananas and peaches. They're unlawful now. You can't well, sell. Well, let, let me, let me ask you this. Though. If, if they're unlawful, if that's right. Yeah. Right. They're, they're unlawful, and equal. so the grocer, the grocer cannot get them, right? No, the grocer, the grocer has them sitting has there. Them. Sorry, Judge Edwards, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, no, can't sell have them. them. sitting here on my shelf. Sitting I would right here, I cannot sell them. them. Yeah, I can't, though, because the government has said- the government has has said I cannot them. sell these. But the money comes back under contract damages. Here is how unjust enrichment in that circumstance would come into play, and I'll-, oh, and wait, I'll Now, if you switch to unjust enrichment- or I'm not. I'm not, because okay. under that hypothetical, that is a contract damage. We have contracted for the purchase of those items. I have paid you. You cannot deliver them to me. You owe me my money back. The court cannot specifically enforce that contract and make you deliver the product. But can I, I get... Can I, can I just add to this hypothetical? Because I think it's very helpful. <laughs> I, I hear what my, my colleagues are saying about it, but what if... What if the hypothetical was the scenario in which the original agreement wasn't as clear as you give me the money and I'll give you bananas and peaches? What if instead the grocer is a local small grocer who only sometimes has these items come into stock and the promise is you can give me the money, but I promise to give you the bananas and peaches if if I get them, 
from my distribu distributor, right? If I get them. And it turns right, out, right. and it turns so, right? And right, what right. you are paying for in that original circumstance is essentially the incorporating the risk that the, the grocer might not get them. Right. right. That that is that is a different promise. And it's a factual question about which promise was made. And let me give you this hypothetical that I've used, which is exactly like that. And it's the fast food drive through hypothetical. OK, when I pull up to the fast food drive through and I place my order, I am reasonably certain, but not as certain as I might be at some places that whatever I order, when I go to window one and pay for it, I'm going to pick it up in window two. Right. If for some reason, when I get to window two, my order is wrong, I'm entitled to my money back under that implied sales contract. Now imagine this with the illegality. This argument. is a different, this is the, pro, this is the this, that's why I think things are getting yeah. mixed up here because I was asking the simple question. Illegality. Illegality, the unlo right. cannot lawfully comply. And you said that would still be a breach of contracts. So I would love to see a case citation that says, even when, performance would be unlawful. We will treat it as a breach of contract not to have done that. And, and, separate and, what, that's Judge separate Millett, and, and I'd really like to hear this too. I think we all, we're talking about on a motion to dismiss and trying to decide credit your arguments or not. Do you get past the motion to dismiss when there is a clear conceded illegality? That's what we're talking about. There's no dispute that what is now being fought about is unlawful right you because have to do it another you... way another way and again I'll, that's all we're I... talking about because then you would switch you both say you would then switch to unjust enrichment if you lose on that well i think that and and i, I, I don't I, know what I, you're saying I, you know, I thought i said this before but let me be very clear i am not aware of a case right okay. in any court where they have enforced an unlawful contract Okay, That's so I want to be very clear. Important. Don't use that verb enforced. That they have held that right. it is a breach. I don't want to get to specific performance. But they have ruled that it is nonetheless a breach of the contract for which you get damages when it would have been unlawful to perform. As opposed to saying enforcement of the contract is not lawfully available. Courts can't do that. Right? We can't well, judge, well, well, here, judge well, this let me tell you this, like, as a breach. I'm going to finish this question. I, right. But yes. then you go to unjust enrichment. Right? Judge Jackson's question, hypothetical, would have been, I'm, I, I don't know that anyone would say, I'm going to give you $50 and maybe you'll give me bananas or peaches. It would be, right. I'm giving you $50, you'll give me bananas or peaches or you'll give me my money back. Right. And it seems to me that's why I was asking before, there's sort of two layers right. of promises here. And I don't know why everyone has spent their time talking about, is it you know, education no matter what? <laughs> or is it education with a limit? Because the question here is, of, of course, it can't be no matter what, at least as to the narrow question before us of illegality, um, unlawfulness. It can't be. That. that just can't be in any contract. So I all, I I know, just to add, all I want to know is the very simple mundane, the answer to the mundane question, can you survive a motion to dismiss when on the face of the papers you've essentially pleaded something that is unlawful? That's all I want to know. I don't think you could. Tell us how you can or what case says you can. Because, well, per performance in this instance this is, is a contract. fact. Mm -hmm. I think we're just asking about the contract claim, right, Judge Edwards? You are. You are, yes. Mm -hmm. And performance in yes. this case of that contract is a factual question. And going to your point, Judge Millett, about snow days, what happens when snow days happen? The I don't classes want to are made up. Oh, we don't want to do snow I'm days. talking about unlawful now pandemics. I'm talking No, about I understand. But, but my point is the university could have said we are going to honor our contract by making up the classes at such time as it is lawful to do so. They did not do that. Instead, they switched to a totally different mode of instruction. Wait a minute. They, You're saying you were damaged here because like they, you know, they didn't wait until fall of 2021 to pick up class no student wanted that well that well that's again a factual question not a pleading question but if the university's position is that it was infeasible or unlawful for us to perform there are such times as they would have been able to lawfully perform and, and nobody we would knew have, when that would be and it wasn't going to be during this semester it was not going to be during this semester but we would have then a different case that we don't 
have here? And that is a factual question, which we have not been able to develop because again, what we pled was- But you're not arguing for specific performance that they should all be now let- that, that No, and we did really not plead to that. progress towards their degrees. That we, instead, very, we were very careful not to plead that right. as well. So that's not what it's about. It's about whether um, there, there are, was there, a, what is the agreement that when I've paid you, but the law prevents you from performing? That is a factual and question. It's an unjust what, enrichment case. And, the, and in the unjust enrichment area, they may come back, you'll have a dispute, I suppose, about, you know, they will have their argument that in fact, we never promised, you weren't, we weren't unjustly enriched because there was always this caveat. Um, and you'll say, no, there wasn't. But it, it just seems to me the wrong place to be having this debate is as a breach of contract. Well, I would just say that as to the breach, I, it, it's a factual question because we did not plead in our complaint that they had to complete that in-person on-campus educational experience during the spring 2020 term. And in fact, I think when you look at the factual analysis that you raised of the snow day, what happens? Those classes are made up. And so when you look at the reasonable expectation of the parties, that would be one potential outcome. However, the university offered no choice here. They did not say we were already past the withdrawal deadline. The university could have also said, we'll give you your money back, but you get no credit. They did not give the students that option. They chose for I did not see them. you pleading that your plaintiffs are going to claim damages that they didn't put off their entire educational career for a year and a half. Um, at that time would have been unknown. Who would have known how long it would be? But instead, uh, so what they really wanted is damages because they didn't get to go back and have classes in the fall of 2021. Those are factual questions. I thought questions it was that... simply, uh, I thought the dispute was simply that, well, we've paid tuition and there's another layer to this agreement. And that is sure, if the law prevents you from performing, it prevents you from performing. But if you're going to treat us like online students in which your clients, I assume your clients participated, that since from their factual allegations, that's what I understand, they participated. Um, they shouldn't have, you know, if they, they only got the peaches, but not the bananas, then they get the money back for bananas, right? That's you got correct. the wrong line, you didn't get the rest of the deal. That's correct. But my point is when we're looking at breach in a very, in, in, in a very narrow focus, it is still a factual question in this case, because there were potentially ways that the university could not have breached the contract, even for the mayor's order. And so there were things that the university could have done aside from that. And those, but those are factual questions. You can, you can, say, that, you can say that now, but I'm pretty sure that when they paid that tuition, it was for this semester with these dates. It, it was, yeah, it is for I a specific tuition, number I know of what classes. Those bills right. Look like. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. It's not right. we'll provided to, to you now, or maybe in three years. Right. And I will tell you that some of my clients, when they were given the option, did, in fact, take the summer and fall semesters off uh, of, of university because they did not want to go online. That is not what they had bargained and paid for. Here, American gave them an incentive to come back by offering them 10 percent off of tuition on those terms when they were going to we're be not online. talking about subsequent the summer or subsequent semesters when everybody was on full notice of the circumstances. We're not talking about that. We're talking about what they were supposed to do with the rest of this one semester. That's, as I understand it, what this case is about. You're not suing about anything else. Did everyone was That's right. Course? The only reason that I raised hey, those points is, is just to point out that, that the breach that we are discussing with respect to the illegality is a factual question. Because the question is whether or not the contract had to be breached. And so you have to look at the reasonable expectations of the students and the course of conduct during that period of time. There's been no factual development and there we was a reasonable it. expectation, you're telling me, that, that, that GWRA would have considered, continued, at least for AU, just for you, but um, would have continued to provide on-campus education March through May. Or given them some of the money back, which is exactly what they did weeks later in the summer 2020 term and did again in the fall 2020 term. And so that's the question. It's not, I'm are sorry, you going that's to... The fact, that's, th those are the facts that you would deduced during discovery? Like I'm trying to- No, the students, no, of course the students would speak about reasonable expectations and you would look at the documents exchanged between the university, but the tuition payments, the 100% tuition payments were paid for a very specific product and that product was not delivered. And so then the question is, is the reasonable expectation of the students that that product cannot be delivered for whatever reason, that some of that money will be refunded. 
And the answer is yes. The reasonable expectation, if you do not deliver the bananas and the apples, is that you will refund the appropriate amount of the money under the contract. Even if you deliver something else, even if there's a substitution, even if you're- Yes, because, and, and importantly in this case, we don't have it in every case, but in this case, that is what American did in the summer. They delivered online remote learning. They did it in the fall and they gave the students a break on the fees and they gave them a 10% break on the tuition. So yes, that not only was it a reasonable expectation, but it's what actually happened subsequent to that, which is pretty good evidence of well, what- Well, ordinarily the, subsequent, subsequent conduct is not considered viable evidence of what people intended previously. I mean, we don't normally take into account, right? I agree, but we're not looking at intent. We're looking at reasonable expectation of the student based upon what the university would do. And I think if you read our complaint, it speaks a lot about the, the students expected to be treated fairly. I mean, this is just about fairness. It's a prorated refund. They're not looking for a free semester. They're not looking for all of the money back. They're looking for the fair prorated difference between what they prepaid for and what they received in that semester. And in subsequent semesters, that is what American actually, I think will contend it delivered to them. Of course, we could get into a dispute about should it be 10% or 15% or what have you. Um, but that is evidence that would go to inform yeah, the basis of the breach. unjust enrichment claim, all this fairness stuff, doesn't it? Well, unjust enrichment does have a fairness component, but uh, under every contract, there is a good faith, you know, there's a good faith and fair dealing expectation of the parties. And so fairness also goes into a contract analysis. Are there any other questions from my colleagues? No, nope. right. thank you. Thank you. We'll hear from Mr. Is it Mr. Schoenfeld? Am I saying that correctly? Or yes, Mr. Your Honor. <clears throat> that, that's correct. Thanks very much. Just for, um, so, just, just before you start, so I, I know we sort of give you ten minutes for each university, but I think we're just gonna you've got twenty minutes on your clock because we want to be able to ask questions about either university at any given point. So we'll just treat it as a collective period of time for both your clients, if that's okay with you. Uh, absolutely, and I think I'm speaking for both of them, unless I specify. But my arguments are common. I think Judge Jackson's framing of this is exactly right. The first question here is, what was the promise? And is it plausible at the motion to dismiss stage to allege or for plaintiffs to have alleged that the university in fact made that promise? The promise we heard from plaintiff's counsel is um, provide in-person education, period. No, if that's, what that not, promise that's, means, not, that's not what both plaintiffs said. The plaintiffs I, were a part on that. So I, I, I think either one, let me take both iterations of it. One, but one is, it, they're very different. And one, I, it, the first one said uh, the promise or what we're alleging the promise was that as a matter of general practice, we will have on campus and live education. That's different so, from your, your formulation. So if, if what the promise in either formulation means is that the university made a promise that it breached, when in response to a pandemic, it transitioned to in-person education, the university never did make that promise. The university never would make that promise. And it's implausible to allege that the university made that promise. And the reason we know it's implausible is for a number of reasons. Number one, where the university did express terms in words, it reserved its right to make changes as circumstances demanded. So if the point here is to get into the head of the university and figure out what it meant to promise and what the students expected, what they expected is that the university generally with respect to any term that might be implied into the contract, reserved its right to make changes as circumstances demanded. Oh, but what did they generally promise? I mean, do you disagree with, let me, let me ask you the Beavis question. Imagine, an in-person school that runs a deficit after take, uh, taking the student's tuition, it switches to self-directed learning just to save money. Is that a breach of promise that the students would expect and that the university would understand the students would expect? So I, I, I think it probably I mean, I've been in this. I've been in this university game too long. And I cannot imagine you are arguing that the Absolutely. university would assume the students did, didn't have an expectation, don't have an expectation, especially where there's a difference between we'll give you online for less and we'll give you on campus for a lot more money. The students don't reasonably expect that as a general matter, we're coming to classes, there will be a teacher there. We understand there'll be this and that, but that's the way we're going to be taught and we're paying for that. So I, universities I don't get that. 
No, I think universities get that. And, and I think they also know that. they can't just shut it down for any reason or no reason and say, you know, we changed our mind. We're going to put it all on Zoom. Absolutely. And they know okay. that the universe, they retain the discretion to make that decision when they need to do so to protect the health and safety of faculty that's, and students. Okay, that's a different question. I want to make sure I understand that we're together on what I thought was the general understanding between universities and their students where the university is offering campus in-person education. Everyone assumes it will be a live place with classes, with classrooms, with teachers talking to students, not Zoom. That's clear. I, I, it is, Your Honor, but I want to make sure that our uh, where, where we might differ is clear. As part of that promise, the university retains the discretion to depart from that general practice where it needs to do so in order to protect the health and safety of the students. That's expressly clear in the reservation of the rights, and that's also impliedly clear. I think that's why Mr. Where, where is it agreed. Expressly, where is it expressly clear? I mean, you're dealing with, I mean, if you're, you're putting that, are you putting all that in the word necessary? Well, so I think the reservation of rights confirm that the universities retain this discretion. The university of uh, the no, that's reservation- the, That's the difficulty, because I'm talking about the GW reservation for now. And that says to make, you know, you've got change courses, programs, academic calendar, um, or to make other changes deemed necessary or desirable. Correct. Right? Okay. So there's nothing spelling out here, health and things like that. Now, maybe you're, that's why I asked, maybe you're putting that in the word necessary. Well, um, so elsewhere. No, you, I, 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 okay. Uh-huh. So elsewhere, the reservation of rights, I mean, there's three separate reservation of rights provision for okay. GW. It also says modify or change requirements, rules, and fees um, without notice whenever circumstances warrant such changes. Warren, but okay. I, I think there's, I, I think there's also, <laughs> well, so I, I think there's there's also a more elemental issue here, which is the I'm law like, recognizes. I'm just back, the up law, back up for just a second, please. Sure. Because you said that was spelled out in the reservation of rights. And what I'm pointing out is that You've got an incredibly sweeping with reservation of rights, which would include Judge Edwards hypothetical because it says or desirable. Right. And then you're like, oh, no, we would never do that. And so and you all drafted this. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to understand is how do we know what the limits are? on what you think the agreement was between students and the university on the obligation to provide on what I'm calling on-campus education, embracing everything. How do we know that? And how can we possibly say this reservation of rights has the limitations that you seem to want to give to Judge Edwards in an answer, but are not in the text of it? Well, so I, with respect to the reservation of rights, there's an implied constraint of good faith. And there's a very well-established body of case law about what constitutes good faith, including in the university context. But implied in any contract where a party has discretion under it, there's an implied limitation for the exercise of good faith. And so if the idea is the university is just doing it to change money, I think that's a plausible case for a breach of the limits of the reservation of rights. But I think, again, we, we might be getting ahead of ourselves because I still well, think no, Judge Jackson... If instead, if instead, if it was, it wasn't, a, we just want to save money. Instead, the day after tuition is due, so everyone has paid full tuition, put aside installment plans. Let's just say everyone has paid full tuition by X date. And the next day, the university says, pointing to this language or the language in the AU one, um, our faculty, world-renowned faculty, Right. Um, have a lot of amazing conferences to attend this spring, amazing research to do that is going to profoundly advance the base of knowledge um, in, their, in their respective areas, um, their ability to teach in future years because they're going to learn so much at these conferences, um, really the, the educational opportunities that we can provide and the knowledge that our professors can provide to the community and the world will be profoundly enhanced if we go online so our faculty can go to conferences and take research trips for the rest of the semester. Is that good faith? No, it, it's a clear to me on the facts as you've alleged that, that that's bad faith. That's it's an breach of contract, made. right? It's an breach, a breach of the implied contract, right? Absolutely, Your okay. Honor. You're, you, the timing is the day after the semester begins. 
These are all facts knowable beforehand. That's absolutely a very clear okay, so it's of a constraint of good faith. They're making mid semester. Don't, don't, don't make it sound like they're making mid semester. They, they could so do think that. Right? Sure. I, I, don't think, I don't think they could do that on, on the facts that you've alleged that I still think that's bad okay. faith. So Those are all facts that. Language. The or desired well, the, language isn't doing much work. And well, so I think it's still subject to the limitation of good faith. And I think it's important just to go back to an observation. I think you may judge Millette. There's no allegation that what motivated the university here was anything other than good faith compliance with, you know, the needs of the students and faculty and also the applicable orders. But again, I, I, I don't mean to be the dead well, horse on this. I'm trying so. to get back to, because we've been going in circles for some time now about um, uh, have is, is, you know, is this a dispute about we'll do it no matter what? And you're like, no, we won't do it no matter what under any circumstances. When I don't think that's really the dispute. I think when they well, want to, they're with, uh, please, please. Um, sorry. They want to say is we paid full freight for this semester of on campus learning. And you knew that we had paid full freight for doing that. Um, and uh, you don't need to talk about reservation of rights, honestly, that much, other than maybe the word necessary, because it was impermissible. It was un unlawful, at least by the time of the lockdown order, for us to have continued providing this on-campus education. And the real crux of this case is, okay, well, we have full on-campus education tuition in hand, and circumstances have arisen um, where we cannot, and no one disputes, we cannot do it. And so the real contractual dispute, it seems to me, is what happens with that tuition? Right. Isn't that the real dispute? No one, no one. I don't. You yeah, I, I don't. I don't think so. I think that's a damages question. And before you get to damages, you need to get to breach. And before you get to breach, you need to know what the promise was. So again, just to go back to the kind of elements here, what was the promise? We heard from both sides. It is a promise to provide in-person instruction. And I'm not going to add any sedile at the end as to what you know, grammatical point or phrase comes after it, a promise to provide in-person instruction. Did the university make that promise? If what that promise means is that the university would provide in-person instruction and it breaches that promise when it transitions to remote instruction mid-semester, the university never made that promise. Well, what if it made this promise? If this is how I understand their arguments, although again, both of you spent all your time briefing the, the brief was all about under any circumstances. And it seems to me instead, the question is, was, did they understand that if we pay X amount, we'll get on-campus education? If we have only online education, we'll only have to pay X minus Y amount. No, um, and for a couple, reason. yeah, so for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's not an apples to apples comparison. I mean, the American University complaint expressly alleges that there's no undergraduate program offered online at American. So they didn't make you a choice between two you different You don't make programs. allegations, but go ahead. Plaintiff's, com okay. Plaintiff's complaint includes mm -hmm. an explicit allegation that there's no online program for American undergraduates. Mm -hmm. So this wasn't a choice between two different modalities where they selected in-person instruction instead of online. And as to GW, you can't, get an, um, you can't get the degrees that the plaintiffs were um, attempting to get here online. You can take certain courses and you can get certain, certain um, degrees and certain post, uh, postgraduate certificates, but it's not an apples to apples comparison. So for the in-person instruction, for the students who paid for in-person instruction, again, I do think the question is what were they promised by the university? And I think Judge Cooper said it exactly right. They were promised a presumption of in-person education. Everyone understood it. But the critical question is, did the university impliedly bargain away its discretion to make a change that everyone agrees was necessary in light of the pandemic? And the reason that the That's difference- That's the question. There's another question. I don't think they dispute that you, you had to stop providing on-campus education. The next question is, do you get to keep that exceptional but, amount of money that was paid for something that we are not getting? So when Judge Millett, I think you charge less for getting the online stuff. Now, there, there's, it sounds like there are all kind of factual disputes about the, the nature of the online program versus the remote learning that happened here. But, but I understand their argument, at least now, to be uh, to have that to really be about we agreed to pay on on campus education tuition to get on campus education. Had we well, not. 
I apologize. But, but, but didn't, didn't you just say that that's not what the promise was? We agreed to pay that for the presumption that we would get on campus learning. That's why, whether it's uh, under all circumstances or not matters. Because the question is, in fact, what they agreed to pay for. It, it, so if I, you assume away at the beginning that they agreed to pay for getting on campus learning no matter what, or with period or whatever, then, then we've already taken care of the issue. But the question is, is that in fact what the university promised? I, I agree with you entirely. Yeah, I, I agree with you entirely, Judge Jackson, about the framing. But to answer Judge Millett's question first, and I want to make sure I give you a legal answer, not a factual one, since this is a motion to dismiss. Whether they, who gets to keep the money is irrelevant unless you find a promise and a breach. And there was no promise here. That's and therefore my, there I'm was asking no a different question than Judge Jackson. I'm asking whether um, when we've paid for something that you can no longer give us, what is your promise? Due to circumstances beyond your control. This is your choice. It's not a, a right that you exercised here. You, you couldn't have done it. Um, Understood, but in that in that circumstance, the promise that was given was a presumption in favor of in-person instruction, which everyone agrees we provided, and then the ability to make a change as circumstances require mid-semester. In those circumstances, there's no breach because the promise is how a do we presumption. know the promise didn't include? This is I'll try it from this way. Did not include. If we can't do it, if all you're getting, what, how do we know what the agree, the agree, reasonable expectation of both parties was as to what would happen, who, who would bear the financial consequence of this change? Because the, the, I, the I GW think- would get to, and AU would get to keep all the money. How do we know what the reasonable expectations were, what the agreement was as to that? Isn't that the factual question? I, I don't think so. I mean, the question is whether they can plausibly allege a promise that the university would provide in-person instruction and reserve the right to change the method of instruction operating under good faith, but cede their right to keep the tuition um, alongside providing remote instruction to everyone. I mean, again, the, the question is the plausibility of the implied contractual promise that they're alleging here. And it's not plausible to allege that the university would have agreed to a presumption of providing in-person education Reserving its right as universities have since time immemorial. And I think importantly, DC hey, wait, reserving their right to what? Reserving their right to what? To respond to emergency circumstances. And it's not just the reservation of rights, but I think the DC Court of Appeals decision in Bash recognizes as a matter of DC law that DC universities. Yeah, but the thing is, that gets you, all that does is get you to trial. That's all. I disagree, Your Honor. Because you're I, I saying, but well, wait, there were circumstances that changed what we were agreeing to. I mean, I, 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 I'm really having a lot of trouble understanding what you're thinking students, because I think you agree we have to, there, there is a contractual relationship between the university and the students. That's a given in this jurisdiction. And if two or three, use the hypothetical we had before, two or three weeks in, the university, can the university say, we don't want to do it this way anymore. The faculty voted. And we don't want to, we're, we're not going to do it. And so I, I, are, we are going to fulfill our obligation by, you can go to Zoom. We're, we don't so want to do it this way. And it's not one week. It's not right after they got the check. So it's I, I two, think, three weeks in. right. I think on that hypothetical, is it plausible to think that the university would say, we will provide in-person education subject to faculty countermand? No, that's not plausible. And no one would make that argument in court. If the promise is we will provide in-person instruction, but we reserve the right, which we will exercise in good faith, which everyone concedes to make these changes as necessary. That's exactly what everyone expected because that's the way universities have operated. It doesn't get you since. past unjust enrichment though. You're not suggesting that, right? Well, I think the unjust enrichment claim fails for precisely that reason because of the promise here that is part of the contract is a promise to provide in-person instruction unless the university makes a determination that it can't to protect health and safety. That's one. So because that's that all promise, about the instruction, it's not about what happens with you pay. They agreed to pay full freight tuition for the full on-campus educational experience. Right. Just seems the reservation of rights doesn't talk about retroact. You know what when, when changes are made after you've paid. 
what happens. It seems to me that's maybe the answer is that there wasn't a contractual agreement about what happens with the tuition, and that's what needs to get sorted out in unjust enrichment. With respect, Your Honor, I disagree. I still think that this question of damages only matters if there's a breach of a contract, and there's no breach of a contract because the term of the contract is that the university will agree to provide in-person education, but reserves the right to make changes as are necessary. And that's exactly why the unjust- Are you saying reserves the right to keep all of your money for a service they're not going to give you, and that they themselves distinguish from the service they're offering in lieu of the one that they've eliminated? That the, well, you're saying the contract is, we reserve to keep you all of your money for the full service, but we're going so to take I, you into a lesser category. And as long as we do that in good faith, you're not entitled to any of your money back. That's what you're saying. That, that's what the deal was? I, I think that is what the deal was. Oh. And I think that's what was provided here. The university well, provided- I, I, don't, I, mean, I just I, don't- where, where are you finding that? The so illegality, I, avoiding uh, inability to perform. I understand why you're arguing it as a matter of strategy, because you want to win the money claim. But- but, but I just don't see any support for that. Where is this coming from? There's no well, doubt in everyone's mind what you mean to do. And you've agreed to that starting out. There's no doubt in your mind. And the students understand the same thing. And you're saying, but as long as we can give you a good faith explanation as to why we're going to mid-semester switch you into another mode that you clearly have not bought. Clearly, whether it's offered or not, you clearly have not bought. And the university knows that as well. As long as we do that in good faith, and we're going to think of something that's in good faith, you're not entitled to anything back. That was our original deal. Oh, no. Well, so, Your, your, your Honor, let me, I want to make two observations. The first one is, is, a, is a factual one. These students, in, in pandemic circumstances, these students received the same instruction by the same professors, same material, got the same course credit towards graduation on time. So I think the if the, you, the discrepancy. We, we really shouldn't be fighting about qualitatively, and I understand what the law says in that, but if you're even making the suggestion, <laughs> you're even whispering the suggestion that there's no difference between Zoom offered education and the in-purpose, in, in-person full campus, that is ridiculous. I'm not making and that suggestion. And very few of us who do this for a livelihood and some are full-time who would agree, that's an absurd notion. It is I, not I, the same qualitatively. I, I completely understand, and I'm not advancing that notion because I think it's legally irrelevant here. Right, I agree. Uh, and so I, I think this really just goes to what contract promise was made and whether there was a breach. But to go to your example, Judge Edwards, I think I return to the first question Judge Millett asked about the snow day. A breach doesn't become more of a breach because it's a week of snow days versus you know, six weeks of a pandemic. And no one would ever dream to argue that when the university closes for a week and provides remote instruction because students are locked in their houses in a snowstorm, that there's a breach of contract entitling them to damages. And it is nowhere to be found in all of contract law that something that is not a breach with respect to a week becomes a breach in six weeks because the circumstances are but my form, different. My formulation of the promise would be that, that what the university promised is that as a general matter, pursuant to past practice and custom, we are offering you and asking you to pay for in-person, on-campus learning. And so, of course, a snow day, and everyone understands because that's custom and practice. So there's really not an issue there. Mr. Schoenfeld, if, if Judge Edwards is correct that that is the promise, was there a breach on the alleged facts of this case? Right. If the promise, and this is where I'm getting a, a little hung up, because I think that if Judge Edwards is correct, and at least one of plaintiff's counsel has framed it this way, that the promise was, generally speaking, you are going to pay for this uh, in-person experience. And as a general matter, based on custom and practice, we're going to provide it. I think that the facts in this case, the judicially noticed fact that takes us outside of the general course of affairs. The fact that it was un infeasible, the fact that it was unlawful means that when the university didn't provide the service pursuant to that promise, they actually did not breach because they only, I, because they only promised to do it as a general matter in the course of affairs that ordinarily exist. Am I wrong about that, Mr. Schoenfeld? 
I think on that iteration of the promise, you're exactly right. I mean, again, I, I think I think the question of damages is a challenging one, and I don't want to be ungenerous here. And my kids went to school and I paid tuition and they were stuck in my den in front of Zoom for several months. And so I get all of this. Um, but you know, the, the question in a breach of contract case is what the promise was and whether it was breached. And there is no universe in which the plaintiffs can plausibly allege that the university made a promise, and here it's only an implied promise because I think we all agree there's nothing expressed, made an implied promise that they were going to provide in-person instruction, no matter the fact that you know the, the 11th plague had arrived and that students would be entitled to a refund in those circumstances. I don't see where impliedly or expressly you get that last tail end about the, the return of the funds. What, what I don't, all see, that I don't see where you get that we would keep it all. I mean, that's the problem. I don't, so it's, I don't, I don't, maybe the contract, the contract, this implied contract just didn't address what happens with the payment. Um, I just, because I don't see, I see the reservation rights, the right to change thing, but I don't see you saying anywhere, and you can, maybe you can point me to it that says, uh, or what your evidence of an implicit agreement is, we're going to keep it. And, and it's not fair to, you know, snow days at the time these contracts were entered into, Education via Zoom was like an, on a mass scale like this hadn't happened. We're all yeah, used exactly. To, yeah, exactly. It hadn't happened. Right. right. And so, I, and I mean, so I think that the expectation was no days was my education will get made up. It'll get made up on campus. Okay. And so, uh, the question here is when you just have this legally mandated um, and the schools to be applauded for the resourcefulness with which they responded. But you have this change where we cannot provide what you paid for. Um, and we have the ability to adapt like that. We have to. You are also, I, if I heard what, what do I do? you. I, with the yeah, money? Yeah, Where's that agreement? I, yeah. And, and, and along with that, I want to make sure I'm understanding your argument. Uh, I, I remember DC case law that says the fact that you have breach of contract and unjust enrichment on the table at the same time. But that's, that, that's, doesn't preclude the unjust enrichment. I'm looking at Bebas's opinion now. He clearly assumed, you can tell me if you think he's wrong, he's clearly assumed, citing the restatement, that uh, if the, the uh, contract uh, uh, performance under the contract is not possible because of changed circumstances, you still, the claim of unjust enrichment can still be pursued. Are you saying it cannot be? So I think when the contract speaks to the issue and the party's rights are dictated by the contract, you don't get to bring an unjust enrichment okay. claim. And I think DC case law, DC case law is completely clear on that. So DC case law allows you to bring a, an unjust enrichment claim in cases where the contract is invalid or unenforceable, which we don't have here, or where the contract doesn't speak, or sorry, yeah, where the contract doesn't speak to the relationship at issue. And I think plaintiff's cases, Cafasian and APA fee litigation speak to precisely those circumstances. But here, we've got a contract. It just doesn't say what the plaintiffs want it to say. The implied term here is that the universities <laughs> will make best efforts to provide an in-person in education, and they reserve the right to make those changes. I mean, the idea that the university would bargain away its discretion to make these sorts of changes under these circumstances is completely implausible. But and I think that's- the question. The question before you is, is, is not whether you could adapt, whether you could stop providing in on-campus education. You didn't have a choice. Uh, or whether you could adapt. I get, I get your argument about that. What I don't see is a separate one about, but, but who bears the financial consequence of this? We have collected for something that we know we're not delivering. We're doing the best we can under the circumstances, but it's not what any of us thought you were gonna get for this money. None of you thought when they paid in January or February, whenever it was, that this is what you'd be getting for this money. There was never an agreement about that or even an expectation about that. So Your Honor, let me answer the question in two ways. I think the first one is, again, and I, I don't mean to um, be thick about this, but I don't think you get to the question of damages unless there's a breach and not, you don't get to a breach unless there was a promise. And here the promise, I don't think I can say it any better than Judge Cooper, but the only plausible promise was a presumption of in-person instruction and a, a, a delegation to the university of sub-discretion to make changes that are reasonable in light of the circumstances. In those circumstances, I think the clear implication is that there is no breach 
when the university exercises its discretion in that way. And because there's no breach, there's no entitlement to damages. The second point I would make is if we are in a universe where we're trying to figure out the difference in value between what the students provide were, were pro supposedly promised and what they were provided, I do think we run headlong into this academic deference doctrine. Yeah, I don't no, think no, 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 there's, there's no doubt. I don't know. I don't know that you would lose on restitution because I mean, and I, I don't want you to think my questions are suggesting that. I don't know how that comes out. That's a heck of a fight because I know the other side of this is I know how much time, money, and effort the universities and colleges were putting into making the switch. I don't know how that plays out. That's a different question entirely. I, I understand, and that's why I addressed it strictly to this question of damages. But again, and I, I don't mean to repeat myself, but I do see this as um, a, a very early in the pleadings question of the plausibility of plaintiff's allegation that the universities promised that they would provide in-person instruction and that they breached that promise when they transition to remote instruction. I think Judge Jackson um, has, has sort of had the framing correct in that way that again, 12B6 motion, plausibility of the allegations, is it plausible? And I think Judge Cooper had it exactly right. And What's I would just not quote plausible? his line. What's not plausible? I mean, we've read Judge Cooper's decision. Um, What's implausible about their contention that tuition will be treated like housing and meal plans? And that is that when you can't do it, and we're not faulting you for not doing it, there will be some prorated refund. Because I, they haven't contracted for where I just don't know. I just don't know where I, I'm discerning that from this contract. The fact that you Certainly. would do your best doesn't mean, you know, you were going to do your best to house people. You were going to do your best to feed people. Um, but you recognized as to those that we need to prorate this. And so how do we know that there wasn't a similar understanding if you between the students and the university, a reasonable expectation, at least on the part of the students, that that's what would happen with tuition? Well, so I, I think there's, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's two things. Number one, let's say mid-semester, the classics department ups and leaves and moves from GW to Georgetown or GW to some other school. There's no refund, even if the students aren't able to complete their semester as classics majors. That's never happened. The university always retains discretion to make substitutes, to put people into different programs, um, to have English teachers teaching classics departments, that's never been part of the expectation at universities. Always universities are deemed to be Wait able to exercise. Wait a minute. I, it's, it's one thing to say we're going to substitute teachers in. Just tell me if there's a case that says if you said mid-semester, sorry, classic students, we can't educate you anymore. We lost everybody. Yeah, I mean, I, we, I was, we can't I'm, educate you. What, what would happen then? Shaking your head. I'm wondering where you're getting that notion from. Yeah. Well, so I, I, I mean, I apologize, Judge Jackson. Sorry, no, uh, what, what I'm asked, I guess I'm trying to figure out the hypothetical and its application to the current scenario. Isn't it more like we're not going to educate you with the particular professors that were on the scene at the yeah, time I, so, in the way? Yeah. Right. So I mean, let's go back. Sorry, yeah. I'm sorry, Judge Jackson. Can we go back to my question? Because I was responding to something you said. Yeah. And so I get, that's why I said, if, if we substitute other teachers to teach the classics or something, um, that may be different. I just want to answer to this question. If you say to them, we can't provide it, you're saying that it's always been understood, oh, well? So, I, I mean, faculty leave every semester, department I mean, shut down. No, okay, department completely shut down, and you can't, you, you, all your other teachers are already teaching. There's nobody to come in and start teaching all these other classes now. What happened? What would happen there? What's your view under the reservation of rights? You get to keep their tuition? I think so, yeah. I, I mean, if you're able to provide an education generally, just not in their major, they have three and a half other years to complete their major with a reconstituted well, department. Not, I think those please are. Please don't change my hypothetical. My hypothetical is, and I'll give you, I'll make it even more detailed for you. Seniors, we've got to finish this semester to have our credits and, the, and it has, we have to get credits in classics. It's not general credits at this point. We can't graduate with a classics degree without it, but the classics department has up and left mid semester. We've already paid, but we can't. And, and the university doesn't have faculty available or equipped to come in and pick up teaching 
these high level courses on classics for the rest of the semester. But of course you have to make a change because <laughs> they left. What's your position? I think if the university is unable to provide the credits and the progress towards graduation that mm -hmm. they promised, that is a breach. Okay. In those circumstances, it, okay. so that's the, not the, within the reservation of rights. Good. That's well, I so just the, want to the, make sure I understood what you were saying. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, the the specific bargain for exchange that's at the heart of these agreements is a number of credit hours for particular tuition dollars, and everyone concedes that those were provided here. So the question of how the university changes instructors, modalities of instruction, you know, course offerings, that's what's left to the discretion of the university. And I would refer the court to the First Circuit's wait, wait, opinion. Wait, you're saying it's to the complete discretion of the university? I thought there was an agreement up front that, no. So can well, I, can you I will provide on-campus education if at least, you know, at least the agreement is to, yeah, to, to the extent possible. So that's not just totally in your discretion. That's your promise to them with the, you know, to the extent, at, at a minimum for this case, at least to the extent lawful. Mr. Yeah, Schoen, absolutely. Can I, I'm the same. Can I offer another hypothetical that might be illuminating in terms of this particular point? So the university has glossy magazines and materials that show their wonderful new chemistry lab building that they've created. It's a million dollars. It's got all of these wonderful features. And midway through the semester, students who came to that university paid their tuition up front, said we want to be chemistry majors because we were so enticed by your facility. Midway through the semester, the facility burns to the ground. And the university has to get restarted, start up the old building, the building that was before related to chemistry. And no, it was not the expectation that students would be getting their chemistry uh, uh, instruction in that other place. But there we are. My question is, in that circumstance, do we have a breach? Do we have a situation in which the students who came to the school expecting that they'd be in the shiny new building get their money back if they're still getting chemistry from the professor the way that the university promised for credits toward their chemistry degree? Do they get the money back in that situation? Is there some sort of breach? There's no breach and they don't get their money back. I mean, again, so all the buildings burned down. So I, every, I, every building on campus burns down. Right. And so the shiny the building, there's no question. The students are not going to win that in a heartbeat. But the, every, right. all the buildings are burned down. The and university, university pivots. And, and the pivot to Zoom. Right now, one at a time. Sorry, let's just yes. do this one at a time. Let's look, yeah. get an answer to Judge Edwards' question, please. If, if the university burns down, and let's say GW moves to rest at some gross apartment building, you know, where yeah, they're no, able don't to change provide. My hypo. They haven't, haven't been able to figure out where they're going to move. They well, so if burn down. So the next semester, the next school year, they have no particular plans. The well, students, for, they for will the give current, us our money back. For the current semester, which I think is what completes the analogy, if they provide instruction allowing people to get credits over Zoom, there's no breach and they don't get their money back. If they move to a different physical space, even if it's inconvenient for students, but teachers are, you know, teaching in broom closets, but provide the instruction and, you know, give them credits towards the orderly progress towards their degrees. I don't think there's a breach. Well, and I don't think this? they get their money back. What about this? Um, they say this, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about the next semesters and stuff. We have time to plan to finish out this half a semester. We don't have another building to move you to. So we're going to move online chemistry majors. Um, and you all have had to go home. Uh, but what, what the teachers, instead of you doing hands-on experiments and learning, uh, the professor will show you videos of other people having done these experiments in the past. Um, and you just have to sit and watch the videos and we'll give you, we'll give you the credits to get your degree. So uh, I, that's not what happened here, but I'm going to answer your question. It's a I got it. I, for a reason. Yeah. You don't need to I tell me what's going happen here. So I think in those circumstances, there's no breach of contract and the students don't get their money back. If the university- well, You give them degrees and credit, why don't you give them credits to where the degree is? So really what GW and AU could have done here is in middle of March, it said, we're not gonna provide you anything. We'll just go ahead and credit you for each class for the semester, pass, fail. See you next fall. That would I don't think that would have been in good faith. No, I don't think that would have been in good faith. The university to stand behind 
graduate de or undergraduate you, degrees you that someone didn't earn? They got their, they're, getting their, they're getting their credits. You did half the semester, you'd say. You did half the semester. So we're going to give you the credits. You did 51% of the semester. We'll round up. You get your credits and you get to progress towards your degree. I, I don't think that would be good. I, I don't think the university would do that. And I don't think it would be good faith. I think for the university to give students um, degrees that they didn't earn or course credits that they didn't earn, I think there's a fair um, implication of bad faith in that hypothetical. I'm sorry, Judge Jackson, did you have more? I don't know, I was just gonna say, but not in the hypothetical in which the university makes a pivot, right, in good faith, to provide the instruction, albeit in a different format, and the albeit in a different format is taken care of by the university's express reservation of rights to make changes to its programs. That's what I understand your argument to be, and that therefore there's no breach in that situation. I think that's exactly right. And the last thing I'll say is I think the reservation of rights is entirely consistent with the way case law, including DC case law, has regarded this type of university decision-making. BASH makes entirely clear that as a matter of law, DC universities retain precisely this type of, of discretion. And it's not reasonable as a matter of law for students to have a contrary expectation or believe that universities are not gonna make precisely this type of decision. And that's consistent across the jurisdictions. I would refer the court to the First Circuit's decision in Quesnongli that makes this point exactly, but as a matter of DC law, as a matter of DC law, it's entirely clear from BASH. Before we switch to the other council, I just want to let you know, it is not entirely clear to me what DC law says about the availability of unjust enrichment in a situation where there is a contract being disputed. The case law is, the, the, is not as conclusive as you're suggesting, that if the contract doesn't cover it, that's the end of it, no unjust enrichment. That is not what I'm seeing, but I'm a little bit confused as I just went back and looked at these again. And the other, I want the other side to know as well, because you've been firm in saying unjust enrichment cannot possibly be in play here. And I, that's not what I'm seeing in D.C. case law. Sure. So I, I think that is D.C. law. But just to answer your question or, or to, to explain that there are other bases on which to dismiss or affirm dismissal of the unjust enrichment claim. There's also nothing unjust here because there was no promise made for all of the yeah, reasons I know, that we've been just, talking that, about. That, that we're going around and around on that. I'm, I'm, I, I, exactly. I'm, I, I, I'm really yeah. at the very limited question as to whether or not uh, will you have a contractual matter that end the discussion on unjust enrichment. I'm not reading the DC cases to say that. Understood, Your Honor. And, and I'll just finish on this point. My, my understanding is Falcone Sachs makes clear that you know the idea that if you have a contract then there's no unjust enrichment claim that overstates things. But I do think DC law is clear that unjust enrichment only comes into the picture when the underlying contract is unenforceable for some reason or where it doesn't cover the dispute between the parties. Where there's a term express or implied in the contract, you can't have an unjust enrichment claim. And I think given DC law about the very specific circumstances under which a claim, contract claim between a university and a student arises, there's a particular peril in reading unjust enrichment doctrine too broadly to supplement no, no, no. agreements. So, thank Would you. Do you Ron. agree if the contract, I think I heard you say if the contract is unenforceable, unenforceable yeah. then unjust enrichment does apply. Um, so yeah. I- um, You did just say so that. I, you did yeah, say Yeah, so that. I think- I, And I that's think what the case says. I think if a contract fails for lack of consideration, for example, then there's a, the potential of unjust enrichment, which is why, you know, to, to go to your framing of the case, Judge Millett, about the illegality, that's why I think it's important to consider it in the frame that Judge Jackson has adopted, which is, is it plausible that there was a promise in the first place? I think when unjust enrichment law talks about a, a complaint that's, or a contract that's unenforceable, what it's getting at is a contract. Unjust enrichment is a substitute for a failed contract. That's not what we have here. I think that's the easiest way to put it. All right, do my colleagues have any more questions for Mr. Oh. Schoenfer? Oh, thank you. We thank you, Your Honor. Even up, everyone up a very long time, but it's because it's helpful to discuss this uh, with you all. We do appreciate the time everyone is committing. So I understand both of our appellants want to do rebuttal um, it's been a long morning, so I'm going to give you each uh, two minutes, please. And can, uh, if, if, if it's okay with Judge Edwards, I will ask you to start by responding to his question about, about what happens. Is unjust enrichment available here? If, if for example, illegality, uh, superseding illegality 
not of the initial want, contract. You want me to take that one, Dan? Um, you're welcome to go for okay. it. Okay. So Judge Edwards, I, I would just point you, uh, and it's on page 28 of our initial brief, the Harrington v. Trotman case. And here's what that case says. Obviously, it deals with the unenforceable. So if uh, there was a breach on behalf of the party bringing the claim, uh, impracticability of performance, frustration of purpose under the statute of frauds or in consequence of the other party's avoidance for some reason is misrepresentation, duress, mistake, or incapacity, uh, a court can grant equitable relief. And so if you, and that's straight from the re-second, uh, from the restatement of contracts. I mean, this is black letter contract law. That is when you have it. But in fact, DC goes further. And if you look further down in that case, D.C. law allows an equitable claim, unjust enrichment, to supplement a breach of contract claim where the damages under the breach of contract claim may be insufficient. And those cases that are cited are Lee v. Uh, Foot with an E, 481, A2D, 484, Ingeber, I-N-G-B-E-R v. Ross, which is 479, A2D, 1256, and International Tours, which is 491 A2D 1149. Those cases actually allow an equitable claim when there is a viable breach of contract claim, but the damages aren't sufficient under that breach of contract claim. And in fact, Falcone, which we cited this on page 30 of our initial brief, says specifically, the statement that there can be no unjust enrichment in contract cases is plainly erroneous. DC law not only allows for unjust enrichment in a situation where the contract is impracticable, impossible, or avoidable, but it allows for the equitable claim in a contract claim. What you can't do under DC law is recover double damages. You can't recover the same damages on the contract claim that you recover on the unjust enrichment claim. And so in a situation where there was an enforceable breach of contract claim, you can't also double down and have unjust enrichment damages, which are duplicative, but you can have unjust enrichment damages, which supplement if you did not get full relief on your breach of contract claim. And that's black well, letter just, law. I appreciate, I appreciate that. If I think we all, I think we all agreed that written in an, into every contract is a limitation on performance that is unlawful. Um, and if that's the case, does that mean that as of March, whenever the, the two schools on different dates said we have to go, we can no longer provide on-campus education because of the pandemic, does that mean that there was never a contract, a contractual obligation to provide uh, to, to, there was no contract to provide on-campus education at that point. And so there's nothing unjust about them retaining the money, that there was always an asterisk next to the tuition tuition bill um, or in all of it, 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 as part of this implicit agreement that we can't do what's unlawful. That itself is a limitation on the scope of the contract. So no breach of contract and no unjust enrichment because it's not unjust because we never promised to provide it in circumstances like this. We did the best we could. Well, un unjust enrichment simply looks at the inequity between the parties. And in this case, as your honor noted earlier in the argument, the students paid full rate, full fare for something. And so that is what unjust enrichment would look at. It's not the intention uh, well, of the university. What did they pay full fare for? They, they paid, paid full fare for on-campus education at a minimum, at, at, at least here, to the extent permissible by law. And they got that. What? Well, well that, that's an additional provision which might void the contract. It doesn't say in the contract, the contract to the extent permissible by law. It's, it's just, just it's, it's not voiding the contract. It simply says that there's a limit on what anybody and, can agree to. And well, Mr. Lilly, with that, the whole problem is that we don't have express language in the contract. The question is what did the contract actually say? So it's exactly. not answer to say that term is not in the contract, right? We don't know what's in the contract. We're well, asking. and what is plausible to, to, to have included. And briefly, if I may, just on that point, because Mr. Schoenfeld indicated in his argument that there was nothing in our complaint related to uh, online learning prior to this. And there is, if the court looks at paragraphs 21 through 32 
uh, of our complaint, we specifically plead and American said at the time on its website, quote, we do not offer undergraduate online degrees in all bold. That has since been removed. Uh, but at the relevant time period, that was on the website. Uh, and there are other uh, things pled there but with respect. They weren't given, but, of, but of course, the shift here was not to an online degree, right? I mean, the shift here was, was well, Mr. a temporary period, a temporary period uh -huh. of online instruction is not the same thing as an online degree. Do you, but do that's you not Mr. That? Schoenfeld's argument. Mr. Schoenfeld's argument is if they deliver the degree in exchange for the tuition, then the deal is done. Right. And our in point is the facts. In the hypothetical, right? In the hypothetical, maybe. Yeah. No, he, yeah, he specifically then? said, and he argued at the district court level that the provision of the credits and the degree in exchange for the money is the deal. There is no deal for in person, on campus education between the parties. And what we have pled in the complaint and what I'm attempting to show you now is not only did we plead those facts, but American even went so far as to say, we don't offer this type of degree. So there was not, not only an expectancy on behalf of the students, which is all that we have to prove, but an intention on behalf of the university to say that, no, we only offer in-person on but campus. Can answer, Judge, but can you, answer, can you answer Judge Millett's question, which is even if there was that intention, even if there was that term, isn't it subject to an implicit condition that whatever they're offering, it has to be consistent with the law. So in other words, in, implicitly, fine, they agreed. There was a contract for in-person degrees, but doesn't that have to carry with it the understanding that whatever it is we're giving you has to be consistent with the law? And if we can't give it to you, you get the money back. That's the part that that's necessary? missing. Why is that? Why do you say that that's necessarily implied in this agreement? That's the Be that's where I'm getting hung. Up. Because that is the very basis of a service contract. I will pay you for X service. If for whatever reason you cannot deliver X service, I get money back. Here we're not asking for assume, all the money back. But doesn't that assume that you're de you're defining the X service to me? They defined it. No, no, no. What I'm saying is that, 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 that if you're saying that it necessarily means I get my money back, then the service that was promised was a, you have to have it or else, right? If, 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 if the promise, if, if, if it is implicit that you will always get your money back for the service, then what is promised at the beginning is a money back guarantee. Am I right about that? I mean, that's what it is. That's yes, the yes, that is okay. what a contract is unless it's disclaimed you're, otherwise. So you're saying that implicit in every contract is a money back guarantee. That unless you say otherwise, when you are making a promise in the context of a contract, you are guaranteeing that the person will get what is being discussed or they'll get their money back. There's never a world for you in which you could have a situation like the ones we discussed. Yeah. No, unless, it's, unless it is disclaimed. And didn't they disclaim it in the context no. of the reservation of rights? Didn't they say? No. no, they didn't. Okay. No, and we dedicated a lot of briefing. I mean, we dedicated a lot of briefing to this and that the reservation is so vague, it would not even under, under Williston on contracts, it is plainly unenforceable. I mean, they essentially say in that disclaimer that we can cancel this whenever we want. And that is not enforceable as a matter of contractual provisions. As I noted earlier, there are other schools that said, if there is a pandemic, if there is a public health emergency, we will not uh, perform under our in-person on-campus promise. That, that would be, they could do that. And the parties would have contracted for that, but, but they they'd didn't. Have to say, they'd have to say it at that level of detail. They couldn't say if it's necessary for us to change our programs. You're saying yes. that's and, and back to my day of the week example, you can't say we are free to not perform under the contract on any day of the week we choose. If you aren't going to perform on Sundays because that's your holy day, then you're required to say in the contract, we will not perform on Sundays. If it simply says we will not perform on any day of the week of our choosing, we don't have a contract at all. We have an illusory agreement. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my colleagues have more questions for Mr. Uh, Wiley? Willie, sorry, is it Willie? Yes, that's quite all right. 
no. All right. All right. Thank Mr. you. Krosky, I've enjoyed you, appearing. Mr. Krosky, you you started and now we'll let you finish your two minutes of rebuttal. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Your Honor. And I, I don't have too much to say above and beyond what Mr. Willie said, which, you know, by and large, we, we agree with and co-counsel with Mr. Willie in multiple cases where we've passed the motion to dismiss stage on very similar allegations that we've presented here. Um, but, but I think ultimately, you know, Rule 8 can be met, even if it strikes a savvy judge, that actual proof of the facts is unlikely. And we ultimately pled all of the elements necessary to assert breach of contract claims. Issues associated with illegality, we maintain the position that that's issues of affirmative defense that um, ultimately involve fact issues that are appropriate for resolution on another day, not on whether we've stated a basic claim for a breach of contract. We know we can because we have uh, in, in other cases as well uh, on, on the same facts. And so we'd respectfully request that the court reverse the district courts with prejudice dismissal of our contract and unjust enrichment claims and remand for further proceedings. Thank you. And thanks. Uh, do my colleagues have more questions? Oh. Okay. Thanks to everybody for uh, your thoughtful presentations and for uh, the amount of time you devoted to this this morning. It's, uh, it's been helpful and the case is submitted. Thank you. Thank you. This honorable court is now adjourned until Wednesday, January 19th at 9.30 a.m.